Hey, what is going on, guys? Welcome to the AV Experience Podcast. Hope you're doing well. We're in episode 96. Going to have a fun conversation tonight. We've got some cool updates from Ryan and some stuff that he's been up to, some recent travels, and got some new stuff for his home theater. So we'll be giving you an update on that. Rusty, welcome back. Had you on the show last week introducing you as the M-Wave event coordinator. He's going to be doing a big role there, and he and I have literally been meeting quite a bit over the past like daily. Uh, <laughs> I think it's daily. It's been a lot. He's like, hey, can we jump on a call tomorrow? <laughs> and uh, the last time was about two and a half hours. So the great thing is he just brings a different perspective because he came on two years ago as a VIP Platinum. Um, so he just kind of sees it from a consumer's perspective, but he also brings a lot of leadership from his uh, job experience over the past. And so it's going to be really fun working with him. So we're just working together to make Sure, the M Wave is the best experience possible for you guys. Jonathan, what is going on, sir? Ryan, good to see you, man. Welcome back to Kansas City. Mm. <laughs> yeah, we flew down to Houston. It was a, uh, it was a trip, right? Because I had to go down there and get all the speakers. Huge shout out to Todd Sutherland and Cameron Troy for helping on that endeavor and tony kincaid who's a fellow integrator here in kansas city also went with me so he was a huge help um let me share some pictures oh pictures are good pictures are good some of you may have seen these already because <clears throat> one of them was shared on the mad vr social mm -hmm. stuff so we're gonna i don't know the best way to share these so let's just do this share so there's the Ooh, 50. Look at there. Uh, so here's the before. Mm -hmm. So this is what we were doing, right? So we had to replace this driver and we put it into this. So big yeah, driver change. How did you get it, it out? Because that's a 400 pound. I, I was going to ask that same thing. Like, what does that process even look you like? You zip ties and yeah, <laughs> you know, very small zip ties, very small zip ties. And Hot glue is how so, it held in place. The Ascendo subwoofer, this thing's 50 inches. 50 inches. How yep. much does just the driver itself, the subwoofer weigh, not the cabinet? Uh, the new one, because it's substantially heavier than the old one, about 400 pounds. Okay. So you got a 400 pound driver. Now I've taken out 100 pound drivers out of a speaker, and it's always yeah. awkward because you don't want to ding up the cabinet. You don't want to drop the woofer. No. So how do you, like, what does that process look like? You just kind of unbolt it and let it fall out. No, we didn't do that. Put a mattress in front of uh, it. Just... No, it involved actually a forklift. Okay. <laughs> so wow. it, it involved a forklift and furniture moving straps and a lot of... It took longer than we thought it would mm -hmm. uh, just because we had to really think through how to do it because it had never been done before. So oh. it was... This was a big transition. The, this sub was actually... As I understand it, this sub, not this driver in this picture, but this sub is the one of the first, if not the first 50s ever made. So this was originally in Germany. Okay. Then it showed up a couple years ago at Cedia in Dallas. Um, so this is the one that you guys saw pictures of. Everybody right. saw pictures of that was floating around the Internet. Yep, I took them um, there myself. And that's this sub. Okay. So it's got some history, right? Mm -hmm. Which I think makes it even cooler. It's got sure. some some pedigree. Uh, but Jeffrey decided that the previous 50-inch driver was not good enough. Okay. So we had to update it. Um, and that's where this came. So we went from a single voice coil to dual voice coils. Mm -hmm. It's significantly deeper, and okay. it weighs significantly more sure. than the old driver. Pounds. And the driver is actually much <clears throat> more rigid. So the... The um, just you can tell from looking at it when you look at both drivers that the yeah. the weave from the carbon fiber because mm -hmm. the, the drivers made a carbon fiber the weave on this one is a lot tighter okay. than the other one. Not that it was badly made; it's just the weave. Yeah. Each individual strand is thinner, so there's a lot more strands in it, and it's substantially uh, more. So I don't know. It's harder that's so not the correct word but for perspective how tall are you six five with shoes on so yeah that's, oh my gosh it's a that's, big boy 
bro. Six it's a big boy. And yeah. It's on a pallet, but man. So that's I'm a big guy. I mean, 6'5", 260, and that thing makes me look small. So, so Ryan, it, it appears that it almost has like a pallet built into it at the bottom. Is that kind of <laughs> correct? Yeah, it has and to because uh, how do you move it around a factory? Yeah. If it doesn't have it and it goes flush, how do you pick it up? Correct. So, so there's magnetic covers that cover that on the bottom. Oh, cool. So you don't see that. Nice. Um, but that's, you're you're absolutely right. I thought okay. you were kidding, Michael. No, I, you can see it right above mm -hmm. the wood. Yeah. There's like these little slats. And I'm like, dude, that looks like a pallet jack could slide it's, right in there. It's designed that way on purpose. <clears throat> that's, that's super because smart. Because if you don't have that, mm -hmm. you are in trouble, right? Yeah. So if it goes flat on the ground, in yeah. the whole thing with the cabinet, because it's, Dual stacked three quarter inch. Um, I love it. What what do they typically make this stuff out of? What's the wood? MDF? No. Baltic birch? Baltic birch. <laughs> what? So it's double stacked. The whole cabinet is double stacked <laughs> Baltic birch. So think about how much a cabinet weighs of just like single Baltic birch and now stack it two on top of each other and that's what you get here. So it was, it was not light at all. Um, but we, we made it happen and we didn't damage anything. So mm -hmm. it was, it was a success. Um, and then we loaded the truck. Uh, I thought I was going to have to drive, but we ended up hiring a freight company. My freight driver was awesome. I met him this morning. We unloaded everything. Uh, do I have another picture? Let me see if I can grab, where is it? So did you just fly back then? Yeah, we just flew back. So let me share this one now. Did you get a chance to check out Cameron's setup? We did, and it nice. was awesome. Cool. We'll talk so about this that. is the truck. after. This is after we pulled the 50 and 232s off. Okay. So we filled, just with speakers for the theater, an mm -hmm. entire 26-foot truck. <laughs> That's awesome, dude. It was... Uh nine pallets and three crates Dang. if i remember right so all the speakers are here in kansas city now the i actually just set up the black swans tonight so that there's two black swans in the living room right now cool um, my wife was not very happy <laughs> because i think my initial words were oh yeah these are a lot like the speakers that were in here previously no, they're, they're not. not. Why do you lie to her, dude? They're no, like it wasn't that I lied to her. It was how it was voiced. And she said, are they the same? Like <clears throat> the same size? And I'm like, yeah, they're... I'm no, thinking height-wise. Like my brain was thinking height-wise. I'm like, yeah, yeah, they're about the same Yeah, because they aren't really super tall. No. Okay. Well, I mean, for a speaker, <laughs> they're still tall. I mean, right. But I mean, they're not like... Oh, funny, dude. So awesome. we took them... I took them out of the box and... I think the first thing she said, there were four boxes. She's <laughs> like, do you have four speakers? And I was like, no, that's, that's two speakers. Because the first part came out of the box. Yeah. And she's like, that's, that's really funny. big. Where's the other one going? I'm like, this speaker isn't even done yet. We don't have the horn on. So it was, she was a good sport. I felt bad, but it was, they're here and I had to get them out. Right. Because mm -hmm. I having them yeah. in storage oh. and them being here was just, there's no way. You there's no those. way. There's no way. So, so right now about, they're hooked up to a core 16 and a PA 16, but I, I have yet to do calibration. They don't sound very good because they're active and they need, they need to be calibrated. Yeah. So what did, what did the, uh, delivery drivers say when they show up to pick these things up? Well, I guess they knew the weight of what, they I were mean, doing. it's par for the course for them. They're not Almost. It's just a big box and a big crate, but okay. he was awesome. So That's he was awesome. the delivery <clears throat> driver was fantastic. He was on time. He helped us load, you. helped me unload. I mean, it was he was fantastic. So I'll be using him in the future again. Paul says now you have to tell all those JTR sub owners to grow up. <laughs> That's a whole when you've got a 50 inch sub, dude. That is a whole different ball game, man. That's a we'll just league. I just let the sub speak for themselves and let people decide what <laughs> they like and dislike. There's no sense in saying what's better, what's worse. It's sure. let the speakers talk. And that's what the showroom's for. Jonathan, so. I just had a thought. You know how you're always telling people that a near-filled sub needs to be within the diameter of the subwoofer, right? Right. 
So technically, the fifties in near field, near field circle four foot from away right? is good, huh? Yes, because <laughs> he's going to be like six foot from it, four foot, five foot. Mm. How, how far is it going to be from it? You think? I'm going to be like three feet. Okay, totally near field. It's definitely near field. So a question I have on that front, and I was thinking about this in the way of my so, own room the other day. In order to get that near field feel, you want that cone really moving because it's pushing air. But mm -hmm. if you get that 50 inch cone really it moving, yeah. you'll be knocking stuff around. You're going to like breaking your back. Yeah. So that'll really? be, I, I don't know how that'll play out, but I'll be curious to, to see how that falls. I mean, out. I'm not going to do it like a near field. It's just yeah. you're in that I zone. I thought it was pretty uh, funny. Yeah, you're sure. definitely in that zone. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that 50 has 35 millimeters of excursion each way uh-huh so it still can get up and move that's but... wild because we were listening to it not like stupid loud but we were listening to it pretty loud and and you really didn't even see it move no. i mean i walked up to it going okay i kind of expected more i thought it was going to be going like nuts you know no. like a foot excursion or something but there's some didn't. cool things coming that are going to be I think pushing that thing even further than what you saw it. Okay. What we saw at Atlanta yeah. Home Theater. So man. that was super exciting. I'm excited um, for you, man. Okay. I mean, flew down there with Tony, flew back yesterday. We got home, hung out, and then I, the delivery driver, drove straight through all the way from Houston all the way here nice. and met him this morning. We unloaded. So the 50 and the 230s are at my house. And then the everything else is at our warehouse and because i didn't want to move the 50 and the 230s again i mean how do you do that what do you yeah. do hire another truck right so goal for this week is i gotta paint so i'm gonna spray all the duratex um, and then we're going to the floor so the 50 oh. in your garage right now mm -hmm. okay how deep is it like the box mm -hmm. 20 or so inches 20 no it's deeper than that it's like 21 or 23 inches so not super deep i mean <laughs> it's just really wide and really tall yeah so i think it's roughly 71 inches <laughs> tall something like that mm -hmm. and about 71 inches wide around there big boy but can't do anything i don't have the amps for him right now so can't even mess with him if i wanted to uh, anything we should else? do a little test i got a little t-amp i'll bring it over we'll see how many how many spls we can get we act dude we actually <laughs> because we when we put the new driver in we had to check to make sure it worked so uh -huh. we hooked it up to a nine volt battery and it felt like i got shot when it, <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> it touched the nine volt battery wow. yeah. it was it was a lot louder and put a bigger hit than I thought it was going to when sure. Cameron did it. And I was like, Cameron, it's on because it hit me in the chest. So what it, is, what is the wattage going to be powering it? How much are you going to send to it? 20,000, 20,000 watts, 10,000 okay. 10, each voice coil. Sometimes you say stuff and I'm looking at chat. So you may have said that a minute ago. And but. then each 32 is also getting the same. It'll be 10,000 because they're dual voice coil. Well, as well. Mm -hmm. So they're going to get, 20k and then there's four 10ks i th think or we may have changed in the 20s i don't remember for the mm -hmm. 821s was that stuff in the crate did your amps come with it like in the crates they're you know? not here yet there's stuff what was in the three crates you said you had three crates and a bunch of speakers 232s in the 50 in the crates yeah, they came in crates. I they were pallets, I got you. No, the I mean they're in crates that are you can pick up with a pallet jack, and then there was four twenty ones that came in a crate, <laughs> and then the other four twenty ones came on a pallet. So it was very exciting. It was an exciting awesome. day yesterday. Um, I got to I'm gonna calibrate or hopefully calibrate the swans tomorrow, mm -hmm. and. Um, the now, other do they give you like PEQ that you're supposed to apply, like specific PEQ, or is it per room? It's per room. So th there haven't been many implementations with the swans. <laughs> so I've got a, I'm kind of flying by the seat of my pants. 
Um, so we'll see. We'll see what they're what they measure. So you are you responsible then to pad the compression driver down to what the subwoofer below or the woofer can do? Because you had mentioned earlier that the 117 of the compression driver at the top mm -hmm. is way more sensitive than the driver. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, you have that's to out of balance until you do that uh, with your DSP. I'm gonna have to do, and it's significantly out of balance. I was telling Michael earlier that when I first turned them on and I sent a 2,000 hertz test tone just to see if the horns were on, it wasn't an insignificant sound at negative 75 dB. <laughs> I mean, it was clearly audible at negative 75. So there... Did you hide your Apple remote, like kick it out the door just in case? <laughs> <laughs> I dropped it. So on the storm, I dropped the horn by like negative 20. Uh -huh. And the woofer is at zero. And it's still out of balance but i because i haven't messed with the crossover or the slopes mm -hmm. or anything yet so it's they're okay right now because i haven't done anything with them they they're active speakers so they need to be calibrated it's not like i can pull them out of the box and be like hey they sound great they need i need to calibrate them yeah um but it's exciting to have them here i mean it's exciting to have them in the room but the other thing that i was going to mention is i also got um a few of the new ascendo 16 inch subs Okay. So it's the new six sealed 16. Um, so that's going to be exciting. I'm going to put one up there tomorrow and see how that <laughs> goes. Cause the only th time I've heard them is that 15 sub array that was I at ISE. I haven't heard them alone. Yeah. And there was, there's been a couple implementations of them. The customers have been floored. So I'm interested to see what they do and what the measurements are like and mm -hmm. how everything pans out. Um, with that because i'm gonna in, i have to integrate one with the swans because the swans uh, level out or fade out at like 55 hertz so they need mm -hmm. a sub badly and then anything else i think Painting, your homeowners association flooring. Flooring. <laughs> <laughs> Name i see all these flooring. comments in here about he's got to be charging more <laughs> <laughs> i see all these comments in here about you're making the jtr jealous uh, and the, then the JTR owner's jealous, and then this comment in here saying the Jeff's the JTR is now going to build a sixty-inch driver. <laughs> well, I mean, Ascendo already has an eighty. Oh my gosh! So got to crank yeah. it up, man. This, yeah. is, this is like the middle child. This isn't even the Mac Daddy. I mean, yeah. <clears throat> Justin said he was curious on surface area. Fifty-inch sub is nineteen sixty-three point five. Woo! Eight eighteens. It's is close 2000. to eight eighteens. <laughs> it's a big one. That's wild. And I bet you That's there's cool. some there's some little ticky tacky math in there too, because there's surrounds on your smaller drivers that take up more space than a bigger surround on a bigger sub. So right. I bet you the surface area when you consider the surrounds is bigger on the 50 than 818s. Well, on the, the 50, map. there's like no outer surround, really. It's mm -hmm. just like just straight out to the edge. Yeah. It's all carbon fiber all the way out. I don't I mean I guess unless we include the the steel surface on the outside or whatever he made that of aluminum. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but there's none of like your, what do they call those? Like My, a foam surround or rubber surround. It doesn't yeah, have that. No. Well, look at, uh, let's bring this picture back up. There's that's, no that's... foam or rubber surround on it at all. So there you go. Uses alien technology. Yeah. yeah. So if we zoom in here, there's no foam or rubber. It's carbon fiber all the way out. How does so that work? I think, so well, maybe it stops here. There. Look no, at the ridges. I think it's right there. And it's just these ridges instead of having a full. I think that's what's actually kind of flexing and allowing it to stretch. Yeah, but I don't know what it's made of. Hmm. Not sure. Oh. I don't want to open the crate yet. That's so awesome. when it comes out, I mean, I got to contact some safe movers to see where we can go with that and see but uh <laughs> i think you should take a picture of the safe movers like movers expression when they you when realize you it's not a safe it's a subwoofer <laughs> don't tell <laughs> them like i got a thousand pound safe can you come help me and then they realize it's not a safe it's a subwoofer yeah. they won't even leave your house until you turn it on at that point they'll be like nope not leaving you gotta turn this puppy on um <laughs> uh... So that's been my weekend. How about you guys? 
Man, I got nothing here that exciting. Well, I did keep my grandson today, but nothing speaker related. Got some new theater seats, not for me, but so we'll have those at M Wave. It's the Valencia Monza. So they're different. They're kind of interestingly, I'll I'll actually get Jessica involved in this one because she loves the way they feel. And they feel different to me because I'm so used to kind of the cushy and the mm -hmm. this is kind of more like a flat design. So it's definitely I got I got to sit in a while to kind of don't they use the same material it. as the Naples suede? I don't know. Yeah, uh, it, it's a definitely different feel. It's not the twenty thousand Napa leather that's on the you know ultimate luxury series. So it's got a different feel to it. But yep, I got the Anthem. Um, finally, <laughs> got the Anthem AVM seventy hooked up in the theater room. So man, it was really cool. I have a friend of mine. I did his home theater tour a while back and he has been offering. He's like, Hey, if whenever you get ready to set it up, I'd love to come over and help you and just hang out and hook it up and we'll calibrate it. I'm pretty familiar with Anthem and uh, he's rocked Anthem for many years. And so I finally took him up on his offer. I'm like, Hey, look, let's just put it on the calendar because I'm taking this business course with Ryan. And, and one thing they're teaching is like, look, just put it on the dang calendar, man. Mm -hmm. And so I set a date. And we made it happen. It's amazing how that calendar is changing the way that I do things and structure my life. And, a lot more uh, things get done. <laughs> it is. I'm way more productive. I'm not counting calling that on you. I do the same thing, and no, a lot more things yeah. get done. Oh, trust me, you can call me. I, I know that, but um, but it was cool, man. He's super knowledgeable. I think he he added a lot to that video, and it was great because I was asking some genuine questions about how it's set up and what are the next steps and. But we just had a lot of fun with that. So uh, if you haven't seen that video, check it out. It's the Anthem um, setup video that I did just a couple of days ago. But yes, yeah, so I'm excited about that. So I still need to tweak the base part of it. Um, something about it is, and I need to take some measurements to see what it's doing, but I haven't had any chance to really watch a movie. The only thing we watched was Survivor the other night. And I was kind of thinking back going, okay, I remember having like at least more tactile, even from streaming. So, but I need to do some, some, uh, testing with the Kaleidoscape and with, um, the revolution or revolution and try out some different things. So see how it is and then do some more tweaking. And I may even get him back over and, and, uh, we'll do some more videos on that and have some fun with it. So, but yeah. Trying to so see what else. before I forget this, Mm -hmm. Scott, when you come out, you should bring your SPL meter when you come to M Wave and we can oh, see. Because yeah. yours, if I remember right, is going to be a lot more accurate than what I'm going to have. So we can we can see what I'm not trying to be in competition. I'd be just interested to, see, just to see what, what it can do. Interesting. Yeah. Let's do that, man. Bring your earplugs or your <laughs> earmuffs. Helmet and everything else. You need to put some bubble wrap around That's the cool. room. The non beryllium swans use drivers from the same company as JTR. Good old compression drivers. Yeah. Cool. We've already got some questions. So if you got questions on home theater, drop those in the chat. We do have a topic tonight. Um, before we get into that, I hear. Well, I want to know what Jonathan and Rusty did. What y'all do this weekend? I, I can tell you, I can tell you what I did. My uh, my son kind of spoiled it in the chat, but uh, he's a sweet kid. He, he, today's my birthday, and so yeah. they've uh, treated me extremely well. I'm a very lucky man. They take good care of me. So, and very beyond cool, that, man. a lot of working on M Wave. I think me and Michael were on the phone about three hours yesterday, give or take. I don't know. It's been a lot. Rusty's got a whole spreadsheet of stuff. And what's cool with Rusty is he's super organized, very OCD. And so, and again, he's actually taking the same course that, that I took and, or that I'm taking and Ryan's taking. And so he's all about, okay, this is something we need to do. When are we going to do it? And so let's put a date on it. Okay. So that's really, really cool. It's helping us to provide more structure for it. And, and I'm still getting up to speed, but we're we're getting there quick. Mm -hmm. Yep, plugging away, man. 
So, and a lot of it is from your feedback from last year and even the previous year on things that you saw, things that you think would make it even better. Because every year we want to get feedback from you and, and know like how can mm -hmm. we make this the best home theater show, period. You know, because yeah. ideally we want you to come back. We want you to tell your friends. We want you to be a part of it because we truly believe in it and we think it's something really unique and special. So, and everyone who's submitted a feedback form, you know, we've read through every single one of those and yep. uh, gleaning lessons learned from that. So we appreciate sure. that. Yep. hundred percent. So happy Jonathan. birthday, Rusty. Thank you. Yep. Happy birthday. Another year closer to death. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's exciting, right? So from my perspective, I restacked the subs into two groups. I knew it was different. And I bought some Nick Master natural foam gum rubber. Okay. Mark Seaton recommended it. The reason I had taken them down was because twofold. One, I had just a towel in there to kind of protect the finish on it in case I don't keep them that way. But the, the top two subs were always kind of like walking. Mm -hmm. So if I was playing it loud, they'd move. They'd, they'd literally be walking forward every time you hit a hard, deep bass thing. And so I like if I was watching a movie, I'd have to go up there and realign it multiple times during the movie i didn't that would be awful just to have the top sub fall off so that yeah. was one reason the other reason i you know i had kind of mentioned on the previous call that that wave of bass kind of is almost too much so there needs to be some work there but i mm. wanted to give it a fair shot and i wanted to be able to have full capability to like really cut them loose without worrying about them falling off so i bought some of this natural um natural gum rubber they call it it doesn't affect finishes it doesn't have a chemical reaction because it's a natural product and it's so grippy that you have to set the subwoofer down on top of the previous one. Like you cannot realign it once it's on there. It's it's just super grippy. So I've played stuff in here super loud, as loud as I ever have, and it doesn't even move. Like they're just they're basically glued together at this point. But it's not an adhesive. It's just a real natural stickiness. Um, so it, it'll come off. And then I finished my first row of chairs with the eight inch dual subs in there. And this brings me back to that point that I mentioned earlier, Ryan, where I was talking about how the driver really needs to move to get that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that acoustic energy going. So here's where I'm falling out on these eight inch so far. And I still got more playing to do. I love, love, love the way they feel. And I kind of mentioned this on the last call with some content, but there are some content that they do not replicate the near field 18. And it falls out like this so far in my experience. And I haven't spent all the time in the world tuning them yet. In fact, they're just running full open range right now. All I've done is a time alignment. They introduce that acoustic vibration from something like an acoustic guitar or a piano or even a vocal that's real subtle energy that you feel that little bit of shake that's so good and natural. Like, I love that. But if I turn on some craft work or something like that, were you know you remember being in my house ryan as i played mm -hmm. that song with a synth drum that just hits so hard and it just mm -hmm. sends that bass wave through you they don't do that and if you try to turn them up to do that it's not the same like it's just not the same well are so, you trying to replace the near field 18s with this yeah i tightened up my row because oh. that's my intent so instead of having you guys know i had enough room back there for the 21 inch subs before i do not now there's only 12 inches in there and I, and I wanted that because I want to have my rear row further away from the rear speakers and mm -hmm. kind of more, if I can, more in between those two ceiling speakers. Okay. And when they were back, a dozen, you know, 12 inches from where they are now previously. So I, I'm going to play with this a little bit and just see if I can bring this row in. I haven't had near field for months now because not since I did the directional bass test and so forth. Obviously, you need an 80 on the back wall for near field now. <laughs> Well, what I what I might end up doing is if I if I can't get the eight inch dialed in to replace, and it's it's really good. It just doesn't. In fact, until I listened to Kraftwerk's song, I was thinking like this is like a total replacement. I don't even near near field anymore. It's so, it's that good. Wow. It it does some things better than near field. Like I'm talking like that 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 high energy bass, the upper frequencies. Near field mm -hmm. can't do that because it's not direct attached and it's not moving enough to really convey that sense of that wave of pressure. Right. But you get that synth drum, that low hertz synth drum, and that near field cone gets to move in and you feel that pressure wave move over you. I guess at the end of the day, if I can't figure out how to recreate that, then I'll probably try to get some, rather than my 21 inch, 18 inch drivers, because they're 21 inch deep, 
I'll either try a shallower cab or maybe even go down to a 15 in that, in that span there. Um, but that's yet to be determined. Still more time to play, more uh, a PEQ to try to see if I can figure out how to well, make have you measured those eight inch drivers. They don't have any trouble going down. Like I, I'm not running them hard at all. I'll send you a video. I, with this main row, I figured out what I like as far as at reference level, how much volume it is. And then I put the next rows where the drivers, the rear row on the ground. And I put rice on top of each subwoofer driver. And I put it in the discord mm -hmm. chat. When I play it at reference volume at the, at the feel I like in this row, that rice is barely moving. Like the drivers just don't have to move very much at all to make you get that, that neat natural feel. Because mm -hmm. it's, it's attached to the chair. It's shaked. Any kind of movement at all is moving your chair, and it just feels real nice and subtle and natural. But you can't. So, if you try to make the drivers it. fire hard, like you try to make those eight inch drivers fire hard to get you that pulse, it's mm -hmm. not It's not tasteful. Mm -hmm. And it's not near as strong either as those 18s. Hmm. So Sheldon's yeah. over there at his house going, Jonathan, I've been doing this for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> He's got what, 12s? He's got 12s on his back of his chair. Yeah. That's wild. Well, I mean, we can't, you and I had 12s on the bottoms of our chair. Yes. So it's not a huge departure for you. If it feels different. Well, I'm not it, saying it doesn't, it, but it's feel different. Yeah, it's just different. Been doing something like this. Yeah. It's different to get it off from your butt to your back. We were mm -hmm. talking about this on the discord thread. Every single one of these transducers that you do in every implementation feels different. Every mm -hmm. driver feels different. The size different, the location different. It all is very different. And so when I see someone, one of the guys on the Discord channel was talking about, hey, I just got rid of everything. And when I went to Krausen, and Krausen does it all. And I said, I don't even know how that's possible, man, because Krausen has a nice tactile effect. It's a lift. I felt multiple theaters with Krausen. Mm -hmm. It's a nice like lifting effect, but there's no pulse of acoustic energy. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. no like vibration from a piano or, a, or acoustic guitar or anything like that. That's a totally different feel. All these things work in combination and tandem to make that most natural reaction. I don't think I haven't found just a single one that does it all. I do. I don't think it does. Yeah. Jonathan, I totally agree with you on that. And I'm using the Croson's or Krausen's, however you say it. And, uh, the 18 near field, same subs you have, mm -hmm. and I'll toggle them using, uh, the mini DSP and just mute different channels. And mm -hmm. it is a very different feel. We watched a movie last night. Oh my goodness. I can't think of the name of it now, but, um, we were there was an elevator and the elevator is kind of like chunking as it was going up and the Croson's give it this really realistic feel. It's, it's an actuator, uh -huh. but it is, you feel, I mean, you can definitely tell it's coming from underneath. It is not the same as that, like uh, the full body impact you get from the 18 inch driver. So uh -huh. I don't think it's one or the other. It's both. But if mm -hmm. I had to choose, I would probably choose the Croson's just from an implementation standpoint, because mm -hmm. they are anybody can implement that in their setup easy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the easy button. It's the expensive, easy button, but it's, <laughs> Usually that's the way it works, but it doesn't take up any space and it's very easy to integrate into your system mm -hmm. overall. Whereas, you know, big 18 inch drivers, you got to be committed for that. <laughs> well, talk about committed. The chairs inside these seat backs are not all the same size, and I was I was really hoping they would be, but they're varying to the point where I got these little three quarter inch spacers, and and in some chair backs the three quarter inch spacers fit, and some I have to cut them down to a half inch. In this last one, a half inch wasn't high enough, and I don't have enough I don't have enough room for the surround of the subwoofer driver to go any smaller than a half. So I literally started filing off part of the subwoofer basket to make the 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 seat back the electric headrest mechanism work and fly right. past there. I, I was in down here with a file in here, just filing on it for quite a long time with a shop back, trying to get rid of the metal shavings. My wife's oh, like, what are you doing? It's like, I'm trying to make this fit in here. I don't want to just throw away this whole project. I've been working on it this long. So, uh, that's that. I love the here. commitment, Jonathan. <laughs> Somebody had asked, um, Don says looking to get the Croson's. I think it's Croson's. That's just me. The CROW is crow. I probably got the, the Midwestern accent on it. Crow? Right, so. Like what it was a what would it be a crow? I don't even know what that is. I don't know where I picked that up. I thought that's how it said, but maybe not. I, and it could it could be. I think it's crow. But anyway, um, he says, "What amps are you using for them, Rusty?" I'm using the Behringer NX three thousand. 
and I'm running four off of it right now. Um, I think you can run six or maybe, I know you can run six, maybe okay. even eight off of that same amount. But I would actually recommend that amp over the uh, Croson amp. It's just, I think it's a better value. Yeah, their amps, I'm sure, are pretty expensive. Yeah, it's it wasn't tremendously more, but uh, you know, with the Croson, I mean, with the Behringer, you're getting a lot more power and mm -hmm. I think a lot more flexibility. Anything else, Jonathan? No, I mean, all that's been what I've been working on quite a lot. I mean, it's most nice <laughs> this last week. It's a little bit consuming, right? It is. It is. He's got to get it right for the. Somebody okay, had, not yeah, waiting for the last minute this time. He's he's doing this months in advance for the M Wave guest. Because you're I've been team. tinkering since the last M Wave, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I'm this isn't anything new. I've been tinkering for 15 years or something, you know, with all this sure. stuff. Yeah, your your theater and Ryan's are both full. So they fill Some, the, the somebody's asking stuff. where did I get the gum rubber from? I'm gonna get you a link and I'll put it in private chat. And I'm going to give a call out for Mark Seaton of Seaton Sound, who gave me that product, because he said it's what he uses and what he's found to be the best. doesn't mar your finish. So if you have, like, neoprene rubber, I was kind of looking up on that, because that's the direction I was thinking about going. But apparently, it's a chemical. It's not a natural product. And it can react with some polymers that are in, like, finishes that are on, you know, finished wood product. Sure. Um, the natural gum rubber does not do that. So it, it came from a place called McMaster Car. Right. And, I'll, and I'll get the link for that and put it in chat for Michael to post. Okay. Are you familiar with that one, Rusty? That shop? I've never. Oh yeah. It. So you know, I'm I'm an engineer, and we buy everything off McMaster Car. They have everything. They're the, uh, I mean, the Amazon of mechanical components. Every nut, bolt, screw you could imagine, and then some. They've got mm -hmm. it all. That so that's a that's a site I'm very familiar with. If they don't have it, it probably doesn't exist when it comes to like fasteners. <laughs> That's saying something. Well, yeah. it came in uh it came in three foot rolls, like width and five feet long, and I had to get a couple of them. Uh, and it feels like a real high quality mouse back backing, like a mouse pad, but it but mm -hmm. a more tacky, more more like a, more adhesive, more sticky, perhaps. Not sticky in the sense that it leaves a mark, but just like it just so it's it's got so much grip on it. Oh mercy. Okay, I'll get your product ID here actually. I'm scrolling okay. up on my phone to get the yeah, link. Yeah, we'll drop it in the chat once he gets that. That's hilarious, man. <laughs> You're right. So this is cat. I'd love to give Scott another subwoofer. How can I do that secretly? Oh, okay, mercy. the product ID, and I'll just give it for those that are on the, and we'll get it in chat too, but it's on my phone here. Okay. The product ID is 8601K41 at that McMaster car website, and I'll, I'll, I'll get this to you on the, in the inside chat. Okay. Go ahead. You can, you can move on. It'll take me a second to do this. All right. Anything else? Nothing else for me. Hey, uh, Youth man, I want to jump the gun, but did you want to talk about the uh, what we got going on over the weekend, or are you going to do that later? Save so, it. Well, let me think. Over the weekend, what you posted today? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I mean that's already out. It's not like that's a secret. So if you haven't seen the video today, we had three really generous um, attendees, and they wanted to give back to the home theater community, and so they have funded a general admission ticket and three home theater experiences. So your mm -hmm. choice of any of those, uh, any three, as long as they're still available, um, you, you can't pick mm. one full. What's that? What do you mean? Mm. I'm just <laughs> debating on whether we let them go to any of them. Make yeah, room. You can't, you can't do that though. You can't, tell everybody, on you can't tell everybody else that they couldn't have access to it and then grant somebody else access. To I it. guess that's true. Hey, I want everybody to know this is how every one of our meetings goes, by the way. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's a lot of different things. Yeah. That's cool. 
I I just throwing that out there, and then <clears throat> you brought me back to my reality. So I get it. Yeah. yeah, I'm I'm all about fair, you know. So I'm all about so, sitting on laps. Nah, y'all can do that. That ain't I ain't about that. But that's all right. Um, how can we go there every single week? <laughs> I mean, it's always around that. It's not usually me, though. Oh, no, I know who it's it usually is. Nicholas. Yeah, yeah. So I know I mean, it looks like it. some of our uh, generous benefactors are in the chat. I see uh, Brian, cool. so thanks to him. And I know I saw Anthony earlier. So Brian um, told me he said I could pick on him. Brian, his issue was he just clicked the buy button too many times. So he ended up <laughs> with some extra ones. And when I was talking, I jumped on a a call with our patrons and I said, Hey, I just want to pick your brain on this giveaway. And I was trying to help allow them to be a part of that process of how we give it away and what we could do and how to structure that. And uh, I said, giveaway, it's a contest. Um, Cause you got to submit a video, 90 second video on your experience or I'm sorry, your home theater experience. And then also, what you want to to get out of Mway and the home theater experiences. So when we're on that call, um, you know, he was just kind of sharing that, you know, he hit the buy button way too many times, trying to help him and John coordinate some some things. And so I had told him, I said, hey, I've got um, two people <clears throat> that have kind of one has gen has donated a general admission and a home theater experience. And then I had another person end up buying an extra one that he didn't need. And so he said, Hey, I want to give back to the community. I appreciate what you're doing with M wave and, and what you do for the community. And I want to give back. And so we're on that call and he's like, well, shoot, I got one that I need to sell. What the heck, man, let's give that one away too. Let's make this a really cool prize for somebody. And so that was really, really cool, man. So I love the community that we have super generous. And so we're grateful to be able to offer that. So we'll do that. For the next, I think it's like what close to it's thirty days, three to four weeks. Yeah, I think so <clears throat> it's pretty close to that. So, because I think we gave until the fourteenth, so it'd be just seventeenth. Oh, is it okay? Some yep. reason I had fourteen in my brain. So yeah. okay, so yeah, so you have thirty days. I don't know if I can post links, but I, I might just post this link in the chat. You have to put it in private it. chat, and Michael have to stick it in public I, chat. Jonathan, I think you have the ability because I made you an admin, bro. You have I'll try it right now, power. but I don't. You got all the power that I got. See if you can do it. I'm I'm gonna try. Here, I might be making it, it. Made me post as you. That's how it did it. So, okay. No, so, yeah. All right. So there should be a little uh, drop down arrow. Yeah. Same here. Okay, that's fine. Now we that's can have fine. some fun, Rusty. Let's go to town here. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> you make me seem like a bad dude, man. Saying all I'm just going to start arguing with myself. <laughs> that's, right. that's hilarious, man. Uh, yeah, and Brian, actually, he kind of um, I asked him, I put him on the spot. I said, hey, would you be, be willing to share? Because he shared about his experience and how much it meant to him last year and how much it's helped him because he's right in the middle of building his home theater. And he said, that was just a huge help to me. I said, dude, would you mind like sharing that in a video? Like just record just a, I don't know, a one minute clip. You sharing exactly what you just shared here on Patreon. And he said, sure, man, I'd be glad to. So he sent that to me last night, got that edited and posted today. So Brian, I appreciate that, man. But he says the theater tours, thanks to these guys, was an amazing experience for sure. Um, and and I want to give a big thanks to Jonathan because Jonathan is the one that has kind of, I don't know if the word is curate, but he's kind of selected these as these are just some amazing experiences. They're all really quite a bit different. There's different styles. There's different speakers. There's different setups, different room sizes. Um, but it really gives you some just some really cool, valuable opportunities to build relationships, have some fun, hear and feel some really cool stuff. And, you know, especially if you're building a home theater, I think it's really going to be beneficial and educational because you're going to get to pick these guys brains you know you're going to be in each home for two and a half hours hanging out asking questions listening to some awesome demos but i just think it's going to be super super powerful so um, but yeah so that contest is going on as we speak midwestavexperience.com slash contest and then all the details are there 
um, yeah. stipulations on that. So, and I just wanted to also thank Drew. I didn't intend yeah. to leave him out earlier. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Appreciate Drew, all man. three of you, yeah. your generosity. Yeah, that was super, super cool, man. But yeah, <laughs> he said, "Don't hang with Ryan. He'll take all your money." But fortunately, Brian, you're. I think you're about done with your setup. So he's got all the gear. He's been sending me videos, and he's like, "Hey, Michael, here's my update." He's got his uh, support beam. He's actually doing a lot of the the labor himself, and so he's he's motivated, man. He's ready to get this thing done. So we'll probably do a home theater tour once he gets done. All right. So here's the question of the night. I know we're starting a little bit late. I just want to give a thanks to to Bruce. Appreciate the two dollars super chat there, brother. So the comment and the question of the night is. Are there biases in home theater? Absolutely oh, not. Nope. <laughs> so this is a, a conversation that kind of spun spawned from last week. And when we when we buy speakers or when we buy, I, I, I guess I'll just give you a framework. I'll give you an example. Sometimes I had a conversation with a gentleman either on Facebook or maybe even in my my comments, but he said, man, I upgraded from the AVM 70 to the AVM 90 and it was night and day difference, like just crazy difference. And the question kind of arises and, and the more that we do M wave and the more kind of um, objective comparisons that we do at the show is helping me to understand that. I think we all kind of have certain biases in different ways. And so I thought it'd just be a fun conversation. Uh, this is Rusty's idea. He's like, hey, I think this would be kind of cool, but I think it'd be a fun conversation around this. Are there biases in home theater? And what are those biases? And even in the chat, you guys let us know what kind of biases um, do you find in home theater? Maybe even, you know, some that you have in and of yourself. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I can kind of start off with an example from, well, man, I'll tell you, okay. I'll tell you my most embarrassing example. There you go. I like those. This one hurt. Um, and it still hurts a little bit today and it's Jonathan's fault. So this is a good story. <laughs> Always blame Jonathan. Yeah, it is. But the weekly reoccurrence. So, um, I can't remember. See M wave 22. I had birth purchased a NX seven, probably a month before, hadn't even taken it out of the box. It was, I didn't have anything else to go with it. But part of mm -hmm. why I was going to M wave was to see what screen and what everything else I wanted. And so still in the box, go to Jonathan's house before we even start the real demo. He's got two projectors going at one time. He plays some demo content and you know, so you're seeing half of a screen, you know, two projectors sharing one screen. And he says, okay, just, you know, real informal, play a few clips by show of hands, which one do you prefer? And I know Michael was sitting next to me and uh, I waited to see which one he raised his hand for. And I, I <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> but um, I rose my hand. And so he was comparing the LS 12,000 to an NZ7. Is that, is that right? RS 2100 NZ7. That's right. Yeah. NZ. A and, and the Epson 5040 UB was the other one. It no, wasn't, the, it that. wasn't, it wasn't the LS 12,000. I didn't know oh, it was a 5040. 5040 UB. Oh, it's even worse now. Man. That's a thousand dollar projector. Old, that's that's older. Yeah. It was a thousand dollar projector. Were you running Mad VR PC on it? Nope. No, nothing. It was just raw <laughs> out of like an Apple TV or a Roku or something. Well, I was tricked because and, I and the majority were, man. It wasn't just you. That was why that was so crazy. Well, I picked the Epson. And then here's the problem, though. And this is where I think a lot of these biases and whatever comes the emotion comes in is i go mm -hmm. i just spent i'm trying to remember what i paid for that eight thousand dollars or something eight nine thousand dollars for this projector that i hadn't even taken out of the box and he mm -hmm. puts them up side by side and i picked the thousand dollar one that, that breaks your heart man it kind of makes you feel a little sick to your stomach like i picked the cheap one and now <laughs> now what do i do like now I'll finish the story though, because as we went forward, sure. Jonathan said, well, I kind of played a little bit of a trick on you here and I didn't show you 
this content that this content reveals. And then it became really obvious on that mm -hmm. different scene. I think it was the, uh, was it the paint dripping over? It was and... probably the LG OLED scene that makes the biggest difference. Like, uh, there's the, just the really dark black floor stuff is where the, where yeah, the difference is I think it was the one with the black solid black and then like, real bright colorful paint dripping on something it was a demo man i like that better on the epson the ones i don't like better on the epson is the like the lg demo. oled demos okay where it's, where it's like when there's super high contrast on the screen and super black on the screen at the time the epson has a better interesting contrast than the jvcs do mm -hmm. just they just do well so that kind of stuff than the nz7 yeah, okay, that's fair. We haven't, I haven't really compared it against NZ8 or NZ9 in that regard. The high contrast optical block does make a difference, but it, it comes at a cost, right? You got to pay for it. I mean, it's not by the numbers, it's kind of significantly better on the Epson LS12000 in dynamic yes. mode than the JVC, than the RS2100. But it can't, it's an LCD technology and it can't rival that black floor. Like it's mm -hmm. LCD has its limits. I mean, think about your LCD monitors at work or whatnot. There's a limit on that black floor mm -hmm. and LCS. LCOS that JVC uses has a lower black floor, but, but, uh, but it's interesting because we've talked about this so many times on this podcast, the Epson, when it's really bright, like say the sun's on the screen and the other part of it is black around it. The Epson has, that's the interesting contrast. That's where the Epson will do better than the JVC. So it's, I don't know. It's a, it's a very interesting dynamic and it wasn't just you, Rusty. I mean, mm -hmm. stop the FOMO was in the audience and he said he thought the Epson looked better too. You know, like that guy's a trained calibrator. Yeah. And and he was fooled too. Now, yeah. like on those first clips, you know. And I know Michael. I he picked the Epson also, and 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 so it it does. It kind of you know this is my first time admitting this, so I, you know it feels good to get it off my chest. <laughs> Two years, Two years <laughs> later, he said, "I can sleep now. I can finally <laughs> sleep again." But <laughs> uh, it so it 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 really does it certain content reveals different things and sure. so yes you could later you could see the difference but it does like you you want to believe that because you spent more money that what you spent more money on is better and mm -hmm. you can really convince yourself and it's really it's it's quite difficult to go backwards and admit that maybe it's not as important or maybe the overall picture you know is it worth 10 times more and uh that's hard it's hard to contradict yourself i think that diminishing returns thing is very real oh yeah, yeah. it kicks in a lot earlier than most people think well i've, I've got to give it to jonathan you're probably one of the most i guess objective if, if, if you can be non-biased person um that i know i've seen you purchase two avrs and one's a lot more and you're like you know i mean when we spend our money, it's like, okay, our brain should tell us, hey, look, this thing should sound at least significantly better. It may not be night and day. It may not be 100% better, but it should be significant. And there have been times you've made purchases and you're like, I don't know, guys, I'm not seeing a massive difference. And I really, mm -hmm. I was hoping to, but the reality is I don't. And so I think you you are, are capable of having a very non-biased approach when you're doing a comparison on I'm, I, I think that's almost an unfair characterization because i think i'm guilty of the same stuff everyone else is if it's if it's not a controlled test and it's not side by side okay i, I mean i appreciate the flattery but i mm -hmm. but i'm 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 just with the rest of everybody else if i if i'm not careful with it and i don't do the controlled test then i think like oh this one costs more it must be better and i had a lot of years where i was thinking that kind of stuff yeah. But, and we don't know that we're doing that. That's the yeah. crazy. Like we don't. And you, and you can't even control it. I don't think. Like it's not. Mm -hmm. It's not something that you can think. Oh, I'll, I'll logically think this. You know, I, I won't. I won't fall into this trap. Yeah, we're gonna have a confessional booth at M Wave. I love it. <laughs> so, uh, uh, to to put another point on this, mm -hmm. and this was probably before. This was 2013, 2014. We did an auto EQ comparison, and we had flagship receivers from about eight different companies. Mm -hmm. Do you know the one that won that test? was a $500 Onkyo. This was a blind a blind auto EQ test and it mm -hmm. used Dolby Accu EQ and right. it had the least EQ application. It didn't EQ the subs, it barely EQ'd the speakers. I think it only did the left and right. It was like the cheapest auto EQ system. That blew my mind. That was kind of like one of the first 
not the first, but one of the first times where I was like, whoa, you know, like everyone talks about how you got to get this better EQ or this better EQ system, this higher processor, or how much different it makes. It really opened up the soundstage. We had 10 guys in here. We're doing a blind test. And by show of hands, you know, and score, we were writing scores down. Yeah. That was the one that won the $500 one with the least auto EQ. Yeah. So that opened up a lot of like thought processes in this whole thing, you know, and it wasn't just me. It was a group of guys doing the testing. Yeah. That kind of stuff has happened over and over and over again with subs, with amps, with speakers, with, with pretty much everything in this hobby. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a process of experience and failing to my own self, you know, falling into the same traps everyone else does. And you had shared, I think on the podcast a couple of times that you had, um, you know, we're doing an amplifier test. And at one point you didn't even change the amplifier. Was that correct? Right. right. That was one that Ryan and I did together. <laughs> and yeah. they were switching their votes. We yeah, yeah. They, they were, were like, that was so to... much better than the last one. And I and I hadn't even switched it. I was acting like I was switching. I was like, come on, guys. Well, if we ever talked about Bob's on the other story? end about to die. Have What's we ever that? talked about Bob's story? From uh, we talked about it at one podcast, but that's the same sort of stuff. Bob, yeah, it's crazy. Bob at the AVR comparison, the AVR pre comparison last year at M Wave, mm -hmm. they were doing a Marantz, um, the I'm call it the distortion ship, right? So they were trying to have people compare like on off on off and there were a bunch of people in there for a long time nobody was raising their hand and bob was switching back and forth and in that room things happen so fast that i don't a lot of times you won't even realize anything's changed well then all of a sudden one guy raised his hand and then another and then another and then people started raising their hands and at the very end bob turns everything <laughs> off and he, and he goes well what'd you guys think terrible. well i could tell the difference and bob at the end of, of the thing said guys i've i haven't even been paying attention i've been back here talking to something somebody and nothing has been changing for the past like five minutes yeah. and, that and was it was time. after he stopped doing it that people started raising their yes. hands when he was actively yes. doing it nobody raised their hand <laughs> And this is the Marantz DAC that everyone yeah. talks about makes a really neat yeah. sound and everyone will enjoy. And it's very musical and warm and mm -hmm. not one person in that mm -hmm. group got it right. Not me, not anybody else. Well, it's not it. that they even got it right. It's that they couldn't even tell it was changing. Exactly. And when it wasn't changing, people started thinking it yes. was because they were, because we were guilty. I, me too. I was in there doing that test blind too. I saw someone else start thinking and then I, I saw his hand go up and I thought, well, maybe I am hearing something. Well, you I, don't I, necessarily yeah. know that you're doing it. You subconsciously do it. Mm -hmm. So and think about what you just said, Jonathan. So you're sitting there in a blind comparison. You don't know what they're switching. And some you see somebody raise their hand like, okay, I heard something change. Mm -hmm. And then that in itself is, I don't know what kind of bias it is, but that is a form of bias because is that confirmation bias maybe? Like you're looking over there, you're like, okay, well, there should be something happening. Therefore, your brain now tells you, well, I think I hear that too. Yeah, <laughs> something just switched. <laughs> so it's interesting. You know, we, we've got to, like I said, this whole thing has opened up my eyes to it. Um, prime example, I did a, a video a while back and I basically, I had an, a Marantz SR8015. And I had just gotten in the Marantz AV. I think it was the 770, might have been the 7705, either 7705, 7706. And I, I had never experienced really, well, I guess I had the, um, I've had a couple of them in. There we go. We got Rusty back. Um, but I, I was curious to see, okay, let's swap it out. Let's, let's do some demos. So I invited my friend Derek over. And the thought was Marantz had come out with the, um, I'm trying to think of what they call it, but ba oh, preamp mode. So preamp mode at that time completely disables all of the internal amplification. And the thought is you kind of have a pre-pro at that point. You know, mm -hmm. we've shut down all of the amplifiers, so there's no noise, no hum. So you really have a dedicated preamp processor, a pre-pro. So the thought was, what if I run this SR8015 in preamp mode using my uh, Monolith 11X amplifier and 
you know, I've got my processor, which is a 7706. Like I said, either 7705 or 6 at that time. I think it was a 06. And initially in my brain, I'm thinking there shouldn't be any difference. You know, you're disabling the amplifier. It's going to act like a pre pro. So I didn't think that I was going to hear anything. So the hard part is, you know, we had calibration run on my processor. We swap it out, or maybe it was the other way around. We had the SR8015 swap it out for the 7706. So there's some time difference there. I mean, it takes 30, 45 minutes or whatever, maybe an hour to calibrate the new system. So there's a period of time that, you know, that, that I'm having to remember what we heard. And so there is that factor. We didn't have fast switching. But we hook it up and I'm going, man, I'm I'm just hearing more detail in the surrounds and in the Atmos channels. And I just, and I don't know if this is really what it is, but I've just always referred to that as better channel separation. In other words, I'm just hearing more distinct information in the side channels and the Atmos. And I didn't expect that. And so I thought that I was being unbiased because I went into it thinking one thing, but then it proved me wrong. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But in a way it, there's still a bias there because I knew that one is a processor, one is an AVR. So could that have influenced my art? What we thought we heard could have been, could it have been just, could it have been um, Odyssey? I mean, Jonathan's talked about this a lot. Odyssey can really, you can run it one time, run it again and it'd be like way out of whack. Mm -hmm. And so who knows the SR 8015 might've did Odyssey like this, but then that the 7706 just may have did a better job on that run of Odyssey and it did clean it up. It did EQ better. So I don't know. Um, it's hard to tell when you don't do a blind and some people even like to do, you know, they prefer even a double blind. So a blind test would be, when I'm doing, I'm giving the test and you don't know what you're listening to, a double blind test would be, you don't know what you're listening to. And the person controlling it doesn't even know what they're switching. If that, if I'm understanding that correct, is that That's right? right? That's right. So That's it's just, it's good. interesting that, you know, how our different biases can come into play. And I, I saw some comments earlier about, you know, why I have biases towards maybe this brand. I don't, I don't know if that's necessarily a bias. That's probably just a preference. But I think the bias comes when we know something's happening. You know, we know Ryan's back there switching a speaker or a cable. Um, and we, we think we know what's going on. You know what I mean? So Well, like your speaker speaker cable test last year was so good when you when you had the bare speaker wire and the coat hanger and than the thousand dollar speaker wire or whatever. And you know, bad. like it, it, there's just no difference in there. That proves out when the speaker, the coat hanger got second place, you know, I mean, that kind of stuff just needs to be more, more common ground, more tested in our hobby. So we can get exposure to this and kind of get rid of some of this nonsense, yeah. the snake oil in our hobby. Sure. Yep. It was it's all fun. really important. The thing that people don't <clears throat> do a lot of times is they don't do the test correctly. Right. And they add so many different variables and colorizations to the test itself that they end up with an invalid result mm -hmm. in a lot of these situations. So, and by no means am I not saying there's a difference. Like there's a measurable difference in a lot in a lot of this stuff, positive or negative, mm -hmm. depending on what you do. But our ears are not measurement equipment. So it's well, virtually every single time there's no way for you to process the difference that is actually occurring so mm -hmm. don't take this as us saying there's no mm -hmm. measurable difference there absolutely yeah. is sure. it's just our ears are not sensitive enough yeah a lot of times to pick this up now if you were to do like um what's his name from asr he's done some stuff on headphones and different things where he can perceive a difference and stuff like that. There are ways to go about on certain tracks that you know very well 
to be able to perceive differences. Now, a lot of times, and even he does this, and he's a trained listener, meaning he can do this and he's been trained to do it. You have to listen to the same thing, the same passage over and over and over again in order to perceive that. Who does that? Mm -hmm. Right. When you're listening to content to listen and not going through and trying to find a minute detail that is different and you're having to listen to it over and over and over again to be able to identify that. No one listens in a real environment that way. It mm -hmm. doesn't happen. So, again, don't take this as us saying that it's impossible to do. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely possible with certain equipment and given, you know, especially I think the testing he was doing was like um, high fidelity tracks versus lower fidelity tracks, I think is what he was doing. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah, no doubt. If you know what you're doing and you listen to something good, long enough on high fidelity enough equipment, you can probably figure it out, but nobody listens to their gear that way. So you've got to establish after chasing the rabbit for a period of time, what is good enough? So right. sometimes that that's one of the arguments that I hear, you know, they may, they're trying to justify maybe their bias. And so they'll say, well, you just don't have a resolving enough system, a system that can resolve those differences. All right. So here's my challenge that we'll do at M wave. Come do it on my black swans, mm. right? Come do it. Then if it's not resolving enough, the horns on the black swans are 117 yeah. DB sensitive. Yeah. Like I was telling Jonathan at the beginning of this, or these guys at the beginning of this, I had my volume set at negative 75 and the horns were still playing a test tone. That was easily audible. Was it really loud? No, but it was easily audible and would be quite annoying if you had that on all the time. So mm -hmm. if you want to challenge it and you want a resolving system, they'll be there for you to use if you want to do it. Yeah. Open door. Cool, man. I like what MW says. He says, for me, if I'm tapping my toes and bobbing my head, then it's good. Enjoying it, man. Cool. Good discussion, man. Appreciate the, the topic there, Rusty. So we're going to go ahead and go into um, answering some questions here. So Bruce says, can you give your opinion of the best streaming device to buy? Amazon Fire, Apple TV, Roku, Google Chromecast, or the NVIDIA Shield? I can't afford a Kaleidoscape. So what are some of his options for streaming? I think the Apple TV is probably one of the best platforms out there personally. Um, I did not like my NVIDIA shield very much. What did you um, like about it? I think the biggest thing is, and part of it is I was trying to use the NVIDIA shield as a Plex server and that's probably not. Oh. The best yeah. That not as a Plex bad. player as a Plex server. That would Correct. be bad. Yeah. Sheldon did that and he didn't have a great experience with it either. Well, he uses it as a Plex player. I think his computer is as Plex server. I yeah. Think. But I think originally he was using it as a Plex server. Oh, I don't I want to say. So that was my, that was mainly all I use it for. I didn't really do a lot of streaming with it. Um, well, actually, now that I think about it, I didn't have a lot of issues with the streaming part of it, but it was the Plex part I just didn't like. But if you're just using it for streaming, you'd probably be fine. So here's a question from Van Gool that we should address. I, I will address this. We had Apple, t Apple. I'm sorry, we had Fire Sticks on all of our devices in the house here for quite a while and liked them and thought there was nothing wrong with them. And then I got an Apple TV and it's just way better. Why so is it better? It's better because the GUI doesn't have ads everywhere. The interface is much faster. It doesn't have delays. The apps are just much cleaner. The, 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 everything about it feels like a much higher quality product. Mm -hmm. The remote works better. Like, the settings in there for video and audio are better. The the Apple in-house brand, like the Apple Music, is fantastic. It's better than Amazon Music for a lot of reasons. Um, the screensavers are nice. Like the words that pop up with the music when it's playing to see the lyrics is nice. Like it just, it's just a higher quality product. And not having the ads is a huge deal. I mean, I'm not even, we're not even an Apple house here. Like I mm -hmm. have an Apple 
phone for work. That's the only Apple device in the house. So it wasn't like we were trying to just draw, jump on the ecosystem. It's sure. because the device is that much better. It kind of drew us into the ecosystem. That's mm -hmm. my opinion. Something to be careful, though, about these different devices is a lot of the apps behave differently between devices. So you don't get the same capability on certain apps as on other ones. Hmm. There is some cross. There is a decent amount of crossover where you're going to get similar capabilities on different apps. But it's just something to consider if you're buying a device to stream and you have an app that you really, really like and you watch all the time. I would highly encourage you to make sure that there's no limitations with that app on the platform that you're about to purchase. But I would agree with Jonathan that I think the Apple TV is the most polished. Um, I really like it. I was a big NVIDIA Shield user um, until I moved away from Plex. I think the NVIDIA Shield is the best Plex player. Um, it just has a ton of capability in the app. Um, and the Apple TV's Plex player is highly limited. You can't do audio pass through. Um, there's other limitations. So the NVIDIA Shield wins there. But as a streamer, Apple TV every day of the week. And there are ways to get, you know, content that you would normally play on Plex to come through losslessly mm -hmm. on the Apple TV, especially through audio. But it's just a, it's not easy. And I think the more I'm in this space, the more I care about easy. Mm -hmm. Rusty, a lot of what you were talking about with the Crosons. Yep. If it isn't easy, not only will I potentially use it less, but my family sure as hell isn't going to use it. And that's yeah. really important. And I think a lot of us, overlook that right we wonder why our families don't use the rooms dude the rooms are really complicated and if you don't make it easy specifically like my wife she ain't gonna want to use it mm -hmm. so if i make it really easy like it was before i <laughs> tore everything down she yeah. could just walk down the stairs and ask siri turn everything on and then when mm -hmm. she was done she'd tell her turn everything off and she didn't have to worry about anything theater was on when she opened the door so having that easeability and that yep. usability is really, really important. And since the Apple TV is virtually identical to everything else in the Apple ecosystem, it's super easy for everyone to use. The other cool thing that I think it's overlooked a lot is if you have multiple Apple TVs, you can actually have them sync. So when you install one app on one, it automatically installs on another one, mm -hmm. which is awesome. So Apple TV for me, plus you yeah. get um, immersive audio through apple music and it's very good and expanding catalog it's excellent there yes i love that man i that's my favorite thing in my home theater right now the other uh -huh. thing like you just talked about ease of use that apple tv is hdmi cec my projector mm -hmm. supports it the epson supports it it's one remote for the entire thing even and my like apple eight year old eight -year -old can come down here and run it yeah yeah and, and and if you have a phone i mean i like i said my work phone I can I can just throw anything up there just super easy. And I know you can do that with like Chromecast and so forth too with Android environment. But with Apple, like I, I installed it for uh, uh, kind of a client sort of halfway that was asking me to help them with their home theater. And the wife of the guy that we installed this with was just like, holy smokes. You know, she's throwing her family pictures up there on the thing and, and open up her apps and it's all showing up on the screen. And she's like, this is amazing. I didn't even know this was possible. Well, yeah, it's been possible for a lot of years, but Apple's really got it nailed down very slick and very mm -hmm. clean and effective. I can show you. So this is the Apple remote on the phone. Let me pull this one. So it looks like that. Make it big here. There's six buttons and a touchpad, and mm -hmm. that is it. Your that control controls controls on your phone control the volume on the Apple TV if it's CEC. It's this simple. And if you need to enter text, your phone vibrates and you enter it directly on your phone. There's mm -hmm. no fighting for anything. My kids love it because the Apple TV remote is super simple. Um, we can turn on and turn off things all on here. Um, mm -hmm. It's just the ease of use with that in the ecosystem. Yeah, it's got its shortcomings, but those are vastly made up for by the capabilities of an ease of use of the device. Yeah, I I just want to jump on the bandwagon so I can uh, <laughs> so I can talk for a feel included. And yeah, so I can feel included. That's it. Um, yeah, I mean, see, we are the Apple household, and so it's uh, it was it's it makes it so seamless because everything just works together perfectly. And Apple 
you know, I like that they put a lot of effort into refining, getting the little, the nuances and details of the user interface. I appreciate that. And it's a, you know, it's a great device and price is great. Um, uh, isn't the uh, shield like five, six years old now and yeah. it hasn't been updated and it feels, it feels old. Like it feels out of date mm -hmm. uh, to me. So I, I'm kind of surprised that, you know, six years is an eternity in tech terms, yeah. tech timelines. Yeah. When we hooked up the AVM 70. Um, I'm back there. I'm like, man, I got a bunch of wires back here. That, let me just tidy up some stuff. I'm like, what is this? And I pulled it out and follow the wire. Oh, that's the, uh, uh, the shield that I haven't used in a long time since I bought the Apple TV. I'm like, let's just get that thing out of here. So I pulled it out of the system. It was just sitting in the cabinet, taking up space. So but yeah, I'd be interested to see if the shield comes out with a new model. Um, but it's been long overdue for sure. Mm -hmm. Good question, man. So Ryan brought up too, and I don't know that this is going to feed something everyone's interested in, but the karaoke function on Apple TV music is yeah. like really pretty cool. It uses a, uh, you know, AI to remove the vocals mm -hmm. and it does a good enough job that it's almost like it's a design, you know, with almost any track that's almost like it's designed that way. Like the vocals are for the most part just removed. So if that's something you're into, it's just a little icon on the music playback screen. You can do it. And a lot of the other thing that's kind of cool, besides the fact that you can get the lyrics up and it has the little highlighting of the word in time and almost yeah. always it's accurate. Like it does a really good job of syncing the time with the word and everything. You can also go down to the bottom and there's a little music video thing. And if there's a music video for that song and there's a lot of them that have it, you can just watch the music video for that particular song if you want, okay. not just the audio. And it has lossless, which most people probably don't know or aren't aware of. Under the settings app menu, you can turn on lossless audio for your, I mean, by default, it's using Apple compression algorithm or something, mm -hmm. but, but you can mm -hmm. turn on lossless with just a button flip. And it's, I mean, it's just, it's just a fantastic product. So yeah, lots of love. Apple. I was going to say, man, we could, uh, next live stream, we got our topic, just live stream karaoke next week. <laughs> <laughs> this video was brought to you by Apple. MW says, Ryan, did you find out how to EQ the subs under seven hertz? I asked Jeffrey and it wasn't clear. EQ the subs under seven hertz. Mm -hmm. You mean just EQ them in general? I think Storm, so. Storm goes down to six now. So I have EQ capability down to six hertz on the Storm. Okay. Um, and for anybody that doesn't know on the Ascendo stuff, it is important. I mean, MW is asking a valid question because like my 50 will do. And it's just going to increase with some other changes that are coming. Mm -hmm. um, right now, it'll do 105 dB at five hertz. So it's it actually is pretty important to be able to get down that low. Um, and the storm right now, I think it's the one that can get the lowest is six hertz. Okay. That was an update that came out not too long ago. Um, I think the so mic, just, my yeah. Earthworks does. Yeah, you need a you need a certain mic, but my Earthworks should be fine down that low. Yeah, I mean Omni mic is calibrated down to five hertz on the new ones, although they don't sell them anymore apparently. But they don't sell all oh, the Omni. Mic. I know I've reached out to them a bunch of times. I can't even get them to reply. Too. I've reached them too. They just say it's in the queue. They, and it was supposed to be released in like September of last year or something. Mm -hmm. So who knows? Yeah. I had one guy, he was reached, he reached out to me. He's like, Hey, Michael, we'd love to have you review it or use it in your videos or whatever. And I'm like, Cool. Let me know. Hey, just checking in. Is there, is it on the way? What's going on? And <laughs> I get nothing. It's like crickets. So I don't know what they're doing. Paul, since while, while we're on the topic here, Paul mentions that apparently the Shield does that on the uh, karaoke mm -hmm. thing too with music. Cool. That's interesting because they're not, uh, Shield isn't doing the music. So they, is Plex doing that? I'm kind of confused. Is Plex doing that vocal removal or is that the Shield doing it with Plex streaming? Like who's, who's responsible for removing it? Mm. Might put that in the comments for us. Paul. Yeah, let us know, Paul. I'm going to hide it there. There you go. Okay. MW, where do you get the 70%? Where are you getting this? Earthworks is 70%. What is that even referring to? 70% accurate? 70% oh, accurate at 6%? Hmm. He says I don't, 
Plex is doing that, Jonathan. Okay. I don't see anything on the Earthworks website that mentions that. He said it's on their site. Where? I don't know where it says this. So I'm looking at their website and it does not say that. It just says 5 hertz to 30 hertz. 30k hertz. You're okay. He said Earthworks. You don't have Earthworks. You have Earthworks, so... <laughs> I uh, you guys are cracking up. I love it. He uh, says cross spectrum labs, you mic one or calibrated down to five hertz. Yeah, I have a well, there's some question about that, like Ryan, because is that right? We kind of know some weirdness with the U mics a couple times we compared them, didn't we? Yes. They usually they have a bump and hurts. Mine always has a bump down there. Yep. I always wondered, like, where does that come from? Is that just because I've seen on it just about everybody's, they plot the graph and I don't care what sub I do. I don't care where I, I measure it from. It goes, you know, it's like this and it goes bloop down at the end. I'm like, <laughs> this looks kind of weird. It's a feature. So yeah. here's a little, you know, free tip for people that don't have the mic calibrated down to five hertz. And this is like, it's not perfect. And it's an extrapolation, but I believe the Umic ones are only rated. I think they're calibrated to 20 hertz. It's either 20 or 10. Maybe it's 10. But um, Aaron 7 AWOL wrote a script that can kind of interpolate the calibration. And it's not like calibrated down to whatever four hertz but it's better than what you would get without that interpolation he's so, modifying the cal file yeah just using a different i think he's just doing a different curve fit to kind of predict what it should be so it's not like really calibrated but it's better than what the cal file would be where it just like a cliff Quick. at 10 hertz <laughs> so oh, it's cool. something is that out on AVS form or was that Discord? I saw it on Discord. Got to be a cool kid on the Discord. Yeah, he's got a little Python script. Sassikant says that last time he called Pars Express, they told me to keep an eye out for April, possibly mm. for Omni Mike. So I think Michael should reach out and see if we can get. Yeah, I trust me, I have. A couple of them. They just won't respond. So. Oh, speaking oh. of reaching out. Klipsch got back mm -hmm. to my local integrator buddy Tony, who's doing a room at um, M Wave, mm -hmm. and there will be some Klipsch gear there. Awesome! Very so cool. they're going to send some stuff out. Nice. From what I understand, I don't think they're going to have any personnel there this year, but there will yeah. be some gear there. Okay. So that's super exciting. Tell yeah. them we want that wall of subs that they advertised. <laughs> the sixteens. That okay. would be cool. Yeah. I don't know that they'll be able to do that, but that would be super cool. Yeah, I mean, I think the more vendors, the better, because there's mm -hmm. just there's really something for everybody. I mean, not everybody can afford a a 50 inch Ascendo sub, you know, but the reality is there's some great subs out there. Um, next year, I'm excited. I had a chance to. I tell you, the more I talk to Doctor Shu, the more I like this guy. He's just so kind. In every email, the just the way he interacts, um, I'd love to meet him in person one day. But and people have told me even in the, uh, my comments are like, I've met him a while back, and he's just super humble, really kind guy. But um, they've got some new subs that they launched, and they're just super affordable. And so I'd love to get them out this year. And he said, Michael, we would love to be there, but I'm going to be a grandfather in June. He said, my daughter would kill me, man, if I showed up to M Wave. I said, I get it. I said, family first, brother. He said, but I absolutely want to be there next year. So I'm excited about that. But I'll have some of their new subs. Um, yep, the HSU VTF TN1. So it's about 1200 bucks. Uh, I made a, just a post on the community and I think even on Facebook. And so you can see some pictures of that that he sent me. So and then a lot of guys have been sharing that post around. So uh, let's see. Tiki time says, Ryan, is there room behind the 50 inch sub? If so, you can mount it on a, on a uh, bank vault hinge and have it act as a door to a secret room. There is room. 
but having to build the capability for that to happen imagine even, even, i don't even, even know how i would build the foundational stuff. part of the door to be able to swing a thousand pound door <laughs> i mean that would be uh, crazy that's funny for in, at least in my house so yeah. not that's saying it. it's not a, it's not possible it's just that would be a lot yeah so speaking of um shoe uh anyone here order the shoes newest sub for the money it looks delightful so let us know in the chat if anybody has pre-ordered that. Uh, Nick says, good evening, gentlemen. Thanks from Kissimmee, Florida. That's near me, man. Not too far. Uh, thanks for all the help that you give with others, uh, with our love for this great hobby of ours, and in some cases, a lifestyle for some. Absolutely. Appreciate the kind words, man. Alejandro. What's your thoughts on the Onkyo brand receivers? Don't hear a lot of about Onkyo. Um, I think they're trying to make a comeback, but um, thoughts on Onkyo? Have y'all had any experience, with, especially with their new stuff? The NZ, what is it, 50 and I think a 60 now? I installed a 6050 for uh, that same guy that I was installed Apple TV for here fairly recently, mm -hmm. and it was a nice little product. Uh, mm -hmm. Adorama sells things somehow cheaper than may even make sense. That was a $300 receiver and it had every feature in the sun you know like all the airplay android built-in apps i mean i don't know how they even do that for 300 dollars. it's normally 700 dollars, but adorama has those great deals every once in a while right. it was a nice little receiver worked great nice little gui hdmi 2.1 cross multiple mm -hmm. ports i mean 300 dollars. come on yeah. what in the world what um room eq are they using they're using accu eq aren't they <laughs> and the and the and some the, of them have what Dirac, but once you go up to their higher end models, it's got Dirac. Yeah. But I think the cheaper ones just use Accu. I think it's Dolby Accu EQ. Okay. Well, somebody in the chat saying that the NR7100 is the cheapest one on the market with Dirac. Okay. That sounds right. What does that run? NR7100 Onkyo. Let's see. So Crutchfield, $1,300. It's pretty nice. good. I bet you can get it cheaper than that. Yeah, if you, but if you watch the street, that's probably product. like full MSRP. So yeah. that's nine point two channels, hundred watts a channel. Uh, Dolby DTS, IMAX. I wonder if that actually includes the direct license. It does, it does for the for the basic one for the not basic Q one, but the basic one. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he says direct is included with that. Adorama had to sale for five hundred fifty dollars a, a few times on that in our seven. Yeah, so how does that even work, man? Because the basic direct license three hundred fifty bucks. You get I don't know how Adorama does that because they had a a <laughs> Klipsch fourteen hundred on sale for like five ninety nine or six ninety nine over oh, wow. the weekend. That's insane. Like, I, where are these pricing? Do they like pull crates out of the ocean? <laughs> containers out of the ocean like some guy i'm just imagining some guy on a cargo ship like <laughs> running around like doo -doo -doo, doo -doo, and trying to find the clips crates and like the denon and morant stuff and just shoving them off in the ocean and then spearing a buoy onto the top for some <laughs> other guy and a big boat can come by and pick it up and put wow. it on and then outer is like i gotta sail and that's where all these prices are coming. how do they do it well, what's also not really makes sense, right? Because aren't they authorized? So how are they, why are they not getting their wrist slapped for offering way below MSRP well, if they're authorized dealers? How's that work? I don't work? think they're doing, I haven't seen the Denon Morant stuff recently. So maybe they're not supposed to do it and they're getting caught eventually. Um, I think they're having a harder time getting caught because they do, they mask it through coupons. Mm -hmm. Um. So I don't, I don't know. And they do, I haven't seen coupons, but they do bundles. Like yeah. here, get these, get these nine Jammo speakers and this Onkyo receiver for $250. And you're like, yeah. how does it even cover shipping? What is going on here? Who is that? <laughs> Something's that going on. That, that it was a physical store that was doing that. And they were blowing away everybody's prices. Do y'all remember who that was? Probably, I, I bet four years ago. I don't remember who chat. Mm. Let me know if you remember that. There was a company 
that they would do online. I think it was a, a physical store, but they would do online sales and like nobody could even come close to that. I mean, they were way underneath MSRP. So, you know, they were, kind of, and I think they ended up going out of business. Um, but man, who was that? Paul Somebody says we better, it. we better hush up or they're going to stop giving their sales. Yeah. Too, too many people know about it. But somebody, let me know in the chat if you remember who that, what that store was. But there was somebody online that used to just do some crazy deals. But then I don't think they're around anymore. You just never hear about them. <laughs> MW, did you know the name? Okay, we talked about that. Uh, you know. Oli says, or is it Uli? Uli. Uh, is the distance figure Odyssey produces the actual distance it measures? Or is it like Dirac? Um, only asked because my near field sub measures like six foot closer than the other sub in front of my room. So is it's that mainly a delay or is that a physical distance? It's not a physical distance. It's it's set there for human visibility understanding, but it's not, it's actually measuring your amp and your DSP processing and all that kind of stuff. So don't do it on physical distance. It's gonna do it more accurately than you do it if you did it on physical distance alone. Okay. Nicholas says, I need help, gentlemen. I'm kind of crammed for space. So I'm thinking about putting my BW towers on top of my SVS subs using ISO acoustics between them. Would that be okay? Let me know. Sure. My opinion is fine. Any what danger in that? Would the rattling of it, you know, if it if it's not internally braced well, could that I did it for years with my JTR. The SVS are fine for that. Um, and my, yeah, JTR subs and JTR tops, it works fine. He's going to put an ISO acoustics between there, so that should separate that a little bit as well. So no negatives there? Um, well, the only ne negative that I can think of is possibly having the tweeter too high. Okay. But as far as physically... No, just make sure it doesn't walk off. You know, even with your ISO, just make sure it's not moving after a couple big bases. I'm just imagining next week and you go, guys, you told me this would be okay. It yeah, was not okay. Look at my picture of my broken speaker. Okay, so all right, let's take that a step further because I've heard people say, or like, even in manufacturers, they'll sell you like the spikes, you know. Mm -hmm. And the whole thought of the spikes is that that speaker is moving at all. It's interfering with the sound quality that's coming out of that speaker to your ears. And I'm thinking, that's crazy. You know, is that a bias in itself? Thinking that, man, adding these two little spikes is going to magically do wonders on this. Or, or maybe even the ISO. I've heard people say the same thing about the ISO feet. Like, man, my bass tightened up so much and my, my front sound stage opened up. I'm going, what? Right. Is that really a thing? That's placebo. Yeah. It, I yeah. I, and I may be, um, I may regret saying this. I may be talking out of turn. I, I think the concept behind it is that if the cabinet has like a certain natural frequency to it, it's kind of like a tuning fork. Right. Mm -hmm. If you if you ding a tuning fork, it's going to resonate. But if you put your finger on it, it's going to silence it instantly. Mm -hmm. So if you can isolate the speaker from the ground, you're not damping that out. You know, I tried it and I can't tell any difference. My suggestion, build a better speaker. Maybe. <laughs> don't, don't let it resonate at certain frequencies. If you know it does that, put some dampening in there. So. It doesn't do that. Just my thought. Christian, appreciate you, brother. Appreciate the $10 super chat. He said, what's the most budget-friendly home theater speakers and subs? That will hit reference. Jonathan, I know you. We had a big conversation on that, and there's one on the AVS forum right now that uh, talking about that, that you always – that that's like one of your criteria for a good speaker is it needs to be able to hit reference. So what are some budget-friendly options that will hit reference, rumble the room, Preferably something that I can buy instead of build, assemble, inspired by last week's stream. Great question, man. If you're here in the States and you have a 
like a professional audio store near you and i'm talking about like dj work or a musician's friend or a guitar center or something like that it's great to go in there and kind of take a look at their say 300 dollars range maybe even 200 dollars range 400 dollars range any of those speakers that they have in there they're going to have on a quick selector like best buy will have or mm -hmm. or your car audio shop where you can listen to the different speakers and just push a button and hear them so you're going to get to hear about 10 speakers and you're going to get to see which one you like the best and any of those at that kind of shop once you go back to the back room where it's like dj equipment all that's going to be reference capable okay. um that stuff's made to hit 115 120 125 dbs without even breaking a sweat and so you know figure out what you like there and kind of pursue from there if you want specific models and you don't have a place like to, to hear check out the behringer 212 XL or 215 XL. There's a huge thread on it, ABS form, thousands of post longs. A lot of people love them. Those are like $200. They'll do reference. I had Mackie's C200s in here. They're about $300. They'll do reference. Great sounding speakers for the mm -hmm. price. I mean, just, I, I won't even put the price on there. Great sounding speakers, you know, forget for the price. They're just a great sounding speaker. And the fact that they're cheap makes it that much better. So Sasakant says that the H HSU. Uh, CCB eights are relatively cheap, reference capable speakers, 94 dB sensitive, 400 power handling, and less than 400 bucks a speaker. I'm not familiar with that model. Do you, um, I'm trying to look it up real quick, but last year at M wave, the SBS room, I was pretty astonished with how good that those little speaker sounded and mm -hmm. uh, they um prime prime pinnacle it was it was was it prime or ultra or i think it was a combination they had, yeah they did they had the prime pinnacles as the towers and then the svs um ultra center um very budget friendly i don't know if they hit reference and i'm i'm trying to look it up they probably don't um at that price but I was I was really pleasantly surprised at how good they sounded. I didn't maybe because I walked in there not expecting much of anything, but mm -hmm. I was talking to the Nebraska Furniture Mart guy, I forget his name, and he told me what the whole like room package was. Um, I'm like, like really? Like, bucks or something? Yeah, yeah, like the entire setup for like fifty five hundred dollars. I'm like, that's that's a really good deal for yeah, yeah. good value, yeah, uh, they, and they they, they were loud. I, they probably weren't reference loud, but they were loud. Yeah. They intentionally to, didn't bring like their top tier, you know. They I do want to provide a caveat though mm -hmm. that the speakers, uh, a lot of these speakers can pass 105 dB, but that's at the speaker, right? So mm -hmm. when you start then including distance into that equation, it starts feet. to go out the door. Mm -hmm. So that's a thing that I think people are always like, oh, well, it can do it. Well, is it going to do it at your main listening position? Probably not. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, where the Kef argument came up that, yeah, it can do a significant amount of volume at the speaker. But the problem that we run into is really you don't need just 105 dB at your listening position. You need to far surpass that if you're wanting to EQ that. Because if you want to EQ it and you're only capable of 105, you're going to clip. Yeah, I, I won't discount what you're saying, Rusty, about the SVS. I, too, thought that room sounded really good, but I don't think it's reference-capable speakers. So if that's your motivation, then yeah. then you might look elsewhere. But if you just want something for, like, a living room setup that sounds great or something, I thought they sounded really good, too. I was really impressed with the way they sounded at M-Wave. I will mm -hmm. tell you, I've measured compression sweeps on an SVS speaker. A lot of them have a one-inch soft dome driver, and we've talked about it on the show before. Almost without exception those won't do reference just a single one inch soft dome mm -hmm. um and i'll show you let me let me share my screen i'll just show you what it looks like in practice oh, okay. i mean you guys have probably some of you have seen my aaron doll video aaron doll where it doesn't it's not quite happy at reference mm -hmm. same sort of thing here with svs right so this is some sweeps i did on svs speakers and we're looking here's the 95 d can you see my screen by the way mm -hmm. okay so here's the 95 db line it's the same sort of thing. This red line, see how it interposes on the red and it starts going down. Yeah. It's, it's, it's gassing out at this is 90 dB and that's a one inch soft dome. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as you, if I tried to bring this one, up, one more up, it would interpose on that orange line, probably further over here where, it, where it's just dropping off at like five or six K just one inch soft domes just can't do it. Right. So that's so, a physical limitation of the characteristics of a soft dome. Yeah. yeah. 
it doesn't mean it's bad. It's just mm-hmm. a limitation in one dimension. And it's not even it's not even limited up here. I mean, look at like 2K range. Like you see how we should have 5 dB separation between every graph. Mm-hmm. We're losing ground here at 90 dB, 90 dB. See how this is this is on the line, on the line, on the line, yeah. more or less. I mean, we even lost some here, but we definitely lost some here. And certainly here we lost some. So that's one and a half K. Yeah. I mean, we're just, it's just not there. So this won't necessarily sound bad, but it will change tonal character as you turn it up. And this isn't a modern, this isn't a modern product line. This is an older model, but it had two mid range drivers and a single tweeter in the middle, kind of an MTM style. Mm -hmm. And uh, my buddy had it in every position in his, I think he he used them for left, center, right. And maybe even, maybe even his surrounds. He just wanted to see how they did. So we measured them and, you know, that's where the chips fall. And like I said, it doesn't sound bad. It's not like they're, it's not like it's making metal on metal fatigue sounds. It just loses dynamics and you're missing, you're missing what we talked about last week on the, on the podcast here. You're missing that dynamic presentation. And this goes for a lot of audiophile speakers. Like you don't know what you don't know, you know, like there's more to it than what you think when you hear a speaker that's capable of reference volume. That's all. Very well said, man. Cool. And Christian said that, yes, he's, he's in the U S so a lot of those suggestions, hopefully he's got one of those. What were the stores that you'd mentioned? Like a guitar center or a musician guitar. friend or something like yeah. that along those lines. I thought there was another brand that you had mentioned that I wasn't familiar with. Well, I mean, as far as specific speakers, I mentioned the Behringer 212XL and 215XL and the Mackie C200 as a couple examples. They're not the only games in town. There's a lot of a lot of two, three, four hundred dollar pro audio speakers. Ivan, yeah. you're still having trouble with this? You want to have a connection with Revel? I thought NFM was getting you the replacement, and that was all said and done. Did that not happen? Let me know what happened. Shoot me a text, because I'll get back into that. I thought that was a done deal, and that you just needed to replace that. What, What happened with that? Let him get back. Yeah, so Christian said he enjoyed the SVS room. Said it was the most impressive room at M Wave last year because I went in there uh, not expecting anything. And so it just kind of, he was like, wow, you know, this is really yeah. so, so cool. And I think, you know, that can kind of play into some of our biases too that we were talking about earlier is expectations. You know, when, when a movie, um, is oversold as like you get overhyped and you're expecting amazing. Well, it was an excellent movie, but you're, you were expecting more. You seem disappointed. Whereas with like SBS, I'm, I was the same way. I didn't expect anything. And I was like, mm-hmm. wow, this is really good. And I heard the price. I was like, this is really, really good. Mm-hmm. Uh Oh, oh. so they're What's still that? doing it. It's just taken an extra five months. <clears throat> oh, that's ridiculous. Um, you can hear that, brother. I wonder what they're replacing the Performa 3 with, or if they already have something. So on the reference line, well, yeah, go ahead. what about per listen and reference holding dynamics? Their speakers are ridiculously priced. They, to a certain distance, can. But once you start going past a certain distance, you're going to lose it. I think the S seventy can do one hundred and seventeen dB, which is not insignificant, but at a certain distance, it's going to have trouble. Depends on how big your room is. Yep. At a certain distance, any speaker is going to have trouble. Derek says, "I got the Odyssey app this weekend, so that's the twenty dollars app you can buy um, on the App Store." And on the Google store, he says he's in a small room. Where's a good starting point to set the frequency range? So I'm assuming he's talking about kind of like the curtain that you can basically tell Odyssey what to, what it is going to EQ and what it's not going to EQ. So would that be something that he would just need to try to figure out the Schroeder frequency? Yeah, he won't be able to do that without a calibrated mic though, because you got to figure out your RTA, the decay. Um, 
But I, but as a general in a small room, a lot of people will say 500 Hertz, like set your curtain at 500 Hertz. And so that means EQ only applies below 500 Hertz. This is ballpark stuff. Um, it's not going to be specific to your room unless you know the dimensions and the RTA time and, and calculate it out. I was thinking that you could somehow calculate that, or maybe there was a calculator online somewhere. There, possibly. there are, I think they're kind of rough estimate are calculators. They, yeah. They're kind of crude, but, um, mm -hmm. Hey, can maybe somebody can explain this to me? What is the significance of the Schroeder frequency and why is that? What, what is, what does that do? Sure. So larger ranges of the spectrum below the frequency that the Schroeder frequency is, the larger ranges of that frequency will be more similar per seating area. So like if you needed a boost at, let's say you had a, a boost that you needed to apply at 85 hertz, it might be a larger range down there. So you could say, I'm going to apply below the Schroeder frequency EQ because it's going to affect all my chairs more equally than above the Schroeder frequency where the modal range reactions the room no longer take so much effect. So like at, at this frequency and above, EQ doesn't need to be applied because the variation is not going to be common between different seats. That's the way I understand it. You apply it below because it applies to a larger area. It's more appropriate to apply that EQ because it doesn't detriment other seats than the main seat. So okay. it's a more of a modal area of the room. One way that I've, I've been explained is the shorter frequency is basically where the room starts to take effect in how um, it interacts with like the, I guess your frequency response and kind of like what Jonathan's saying, if let's say for instance, if it is in your room, it's 500 Hertz and above, if you go from seat one to two to three to four, 500 above, they pretty much are pretty consistent, but it's everything below that, that they, you start seeing all these deviations. So you may have a big hump here in this seat, which may have a big dip in this seat, but that's mm -hmm. lower than 500 Hertz. So the idea and the concept is tell Odyssey or Dirac, Hey, I don't want you trying to EQ this because I'd rather just the room just be natural because it's going to be real consistent anyway in my room. W would it be correct to say that room modes or at least room modes that you can actually that matter are all on the under 500 Hertz range. And that's why it's, it's not as simple as 500 Hertz. That's just well, like a real yeah. loose estimate. Some people do a thousand, some people do 750. <laughs> I've heard people doing 400 Hertz, but generally like when, I calculated, room, when I calculate the shorter frequency in my room, it's like 95 or 90 Hertz. Really that low. It's mm -hmm. low. It depends on the room though. Yeah. yeah. And you can measure it too, right? With, um, Rue or Omnimic? You yes, you have a you measure an RTA like a decay a decay plot in there, and then you probably get into mathematical formula. I'll link a link for it, how to calculate it. I don't remember off the top of my head. I had to just look it up. Somebody's but I did it in my room like using calculator. my RTA. What's that, Michael? For some reason I was thinking there was like a calculator online where you know, it would you be just have to estimate without an RTA with an eye where your seats are, and it goes okay, kind of like the room mode calculator. So, so there so. are the, the problem with those calculators is they always, they make a lot of assumptions on mm -hmm. your room materials and, you know, they don't, they, it's like always perfect rectangular mm -hmm. geometry with no furniture or no, you know, like there's, it's perfect. So that there's so many assumptions. Yeah. It's like, it gets you in the ballpark, mm -hmm. but I don't yeah. think that they uh, are not precise, but I don't know if we care about being that precise because a lot of times I see, you know, like Schroeder frequency is actually in the 100 to 200 Hertz range. And that's why I was wondering if we, we you, you see 500 Hertz, it's like, well, look, that covers you. And then some, um, mm -hmm. maybe that was part of it, but. And Sass, Sassicant says the larger the room, the typically the lower the Schroeder frequency is generally. Um, yeah, so Croson says easiest way to do it is measure in a spot a couple of times and then move the mic six inches, take a couple more, and you'll see where the base changes drastically just by the six inches. So moving that around and kind of seeing at what, when does it stop kind of making changes, like what frequency? Is that a safe assumption there, Jonathan? 
Is that how you did it? You um, had a different approach. I, I think it would probably depend on your measurement locations. And if you're trying to do two rows and stuff, it's probably not going to be apples to apples. Like it's probably meant to be a smaller range if you're going to try to to be real precise like that. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm not an engineer in this regard, but that's just what I've read is basically if you're going to, if you, EQ can be detrimental if it's applied too high is the theory here. And so you're, you're knocking off EQ above the point where it could be detrimental to different seats and you're applying EQ where it should be more similar between different seats. That's kind of the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And to get it precisely to your room, you're going to have to calculate it. Otherwise you're just guessing and there's nothing wrong with that. You can apply your curtain at 500 hertz and then just reapply your curtain at a different hertz, like say th try 300 and see if you like that better or worse, you know, and just l listen to it for a couple nights and play with it and see what you think. I've, uh, I've experimented with that some myself. I tried probably six or eight different Schroeder frequency ranges and, and just, I tried like, uh, my, what my calculator was like 90, 95. I tried 110. I tried 150. I tried doubling it to 180. Then I tried the 300 and the 500, like kind of what people recommend. Mm -hmm. I personally, in my room, if I was going to use it, it'd be the lower side. I think I, of those that I tried, I kind of liked the 180, which was doubling what my crossover point was on my speakers. I prefer 90 on the speaker. So I was saying, all right, let's give it another uh, let's give it a little bit more to apply eq to basically double my crossover frequency it was just kind of a logical point and might be placebo or whatever but that's kind of where i liked it at the end of the day when i was playing with it i was about to say um yeah you're probably oh, yeah. that bias is kicking in really good about oh yeah that. like i i logically think this makes sense it probably sounds the best oh yeah, oh, yeah it sounds the best no, sure i love it but cool man but the the good thing dave is that you can play with that and set it let me put his comment back up here you know, you can try it at one, you know, one frequency. And the great thing with Odyssey is it's easy to change that back. And if you've got one of the newer uh, Denon or Marantz AVRs, you can actually, actually load that Odyssey as one of the presets and then do another Odyssey, maybe at a different. And then you can more easily be able to switch those back and forth without having to go into the Odyssey app, change it, upload it to the AVR, and then you got to, you know, 30 seconds or a minute in between those. So good question, man. So oh, that was Rick says, finally building my room. How many 20 amp circuits should I put in my room for the rack? It's got four JTR RS ones and anything else that you can think of. We've hit this a couple of times, Rick. I run two JTR RS twos on a single 20 amp circuit. Everything in my room, all of my amplifiers, um, pretty much everything except for my lights and except for my projector is on a single 20 amp. And I've had zero issues with that at all. Um, Jonathan runs multiple. What do you have, 20s in your room? I have two 20s. Two Sorry, 20s. I was trying to trace That's down good. that shorter frequency. Link. Rusty, what are you running? So I'm running two twenties and I wish I had at least a third. Um, so that? one, so I'm running two JTR RS twos. So four drivers on mm -hmm. one 20 amp circuit. Mm -hmm. And I've never had that trip of breaker and I'm, you know, we do some stupid demos. So, um, <laughs> however, on the four subs, the four 18 inch subs behind the seats. Okay. I'm running those plus my entire rack off of another 20 amp circuit. And that's just due to the house was built when I got here, you know, right. I didn't have an option. 99% of the time. I, well, okay. During normal watching, I've never tripped the breaker, but mm -hmm. when I'm doing like Dolby amaze demos at, at reference, um, depends on how much time, you know, breakers don't just trip instantly. They have to, they'll heat up. So you can yeah. even go over 20 amps for a, a bit. It, it's right. based on heat. Um, so they will, I mean, I, I, I do trip breakers playing the amaze demo at reference, but I mean, I'm running, I'm running a lot of gear. There's a whole lot of stuff plugged into one 20 amp circuit. Right. I wonder something I've wondered about, you know, I remember back in the car audio days, you get these giant capacitors, like <laughs> one ferry yeah. capacitor. Right. Yeah. Can, is there is there a home theater equivalent to where you could have like a little short term battery or capacitor bank or something? Does that I've exist? seen them at Expona and they're so expensive. Aren't those things like 
fluorescent lighted and beautiful like metal five hundred thousand dollar type things. What? Yeah. Well, no, know. there's what cheaper options. Was? There's way cheaper options than that, but they are not cheap and they weigh a lot. It's effectively like a huge capacitor battery thing. My boss at Mad VR has one. I can't remember the brand. It was in one of the more expensive rooms, and they're literally the size of a desk. I mean, they're huge oh. monstrosities. It's well, overkill, of course. That they the one... don't have to be that big. I mean, the one my boss has is sits at the bottom of his rack. Okay, because I've I've seen like you know the car audio ones I remember about the size of like a the big monster cans. You know, yes. um, storm oh, storm yes. tank, storm tank, yeah. I've never heard of that. Does that sound familiar, Jonathan? Not to me, or but that might that doesn't mean it's not not a legit brand or anything. But so we, are, yeah, these, are they legit? Do they really work? They worked in car audio for sure. I mean, you probably saw your headlines stop dimming when you used them. I used them back in the day. Yeah, the one for odd for odd, farad farad caps. How do you say that word? Yeah, I think I think the it was like one farad. I think that's yeah. what it was. Yeah, I mean, they absolutely work in car audio because, I mean, it would be as simple as test as having your headlights dim or not. You know, when you installed it, your headlights didn't dim anymore. So these are... I don't know that they're so necessary with our house voltage, though, is it? Like and the amp and the currents that's supplied in our house. I mean, think about the difference. Oh, there you the, go. Yes, that kind of stuff <laughs> is what I'm talking about. Yeah, that I, that's all it's my power. It's there even the same color, I remember. Although I think the ones I saw were huge, and those I can't tell how big they are. Yeah, that's funny. So the five thousand has a fifteen hundred watt max. Fifteen thousand? No. no fifteen hundred. Oh, yeah. well, that's kind of that's, that's <laughs> not that that's big. Much? <laughs> I don't know. That's a that's fifteen a amp old, circuit. That's a big old um, one speaker in my room. Device, yeah. <laughs> cool. Hey, I saw the the chat come in where is it at it was right near there do they come uh, with spikes i don't know yeah do they come with what ryan spikes spikes <laughs> here it is isolation spikes fries electronics so they're going back to the store i was telling you about that always was blowing out everybody on their pricing so they would just run these crazy and they they were just manipulating it somehow but I'm pretty sure it's Fry. Let me know in the chat. Are they still in business? I kind of think they went out of business. Fry's is dead. Yeah. So, but they were they were doing that. They were doing some, and maybe it was because they were going out of business. But they mm. were so far under, like the dealers were getting really frustrated because they could not compete at all. I mean, so yeah, appreciate that. That was the name I was looking for. I love Fry's Electronics. I could I could go blow a paycheck there in a heartbeat. <laughs> Fry's is fried. It closed three years ago. Okay, appreciate it, Joey. Yeah, Fry's went bankrupt. Uh, uh, and now we know why they were giving everything away. Some shady stuff. They couldn't make a profit. Uh, MW Jonathan, you obviously have enough bass from 120 hertz down. Have you thought of fixing the dynamic range from 150 hertz to 550 hertz? I saw that earlier. I'm not sure what he means. I don't know either. I mean, my speakers have plenty of headroom at that range. So, what are I, MW, if you're still on here, yeah. elaborate a little bit for Let me. Let us know. Frank says, Rusty, does that Behringer driving the Crosons get loud when the action gets going? So, is the um, Behringer pretty loud or do you replace the fan in it? I did do the fan swap. I mean, it's super easy once you once you finally locate the instructions. I guess you don't really even need the instructions. Um, mm -hmm. But I also have it inside of a, a cabinet. You know, it's covered with you know like a regular wood cabinet door, so I don't hear anything, mm -hmm. and I certainly mm -hmm. don't hear anything over the speakers. Cool. Yeah, a lot I of think guys. The... Go ahead, Michael. I was just gonna say a lot of guys when they run. Um, like Behringer amps, those pro audio amps, usually the fans are pretty loud because mm -hmm. if you think about like a live band, they could care less if the fans are loud. So yeah, you they're not worried it. about being super quiet. But when guys are bringing them into the home theater space, now you are concerned about getting a low noise floor. So um, what is it? Basically like a computer fan? Yeah. It's a really quiet it's computer fan that you swap it out with. Yeah, Noctua, it's usually Noctua. Yeah, the the light brown and dark brown. Get them on Amazon for like What's ten. It 
Not N O C T U A. Okay. Here, I'll post it if anybody's interested. Okay. Well, I was going to say the old iNukes, I don't think the NXs have that same fan problem that the spin up, but the old iNukes back when they first launched 2010, 2011, like the first generation, mm-hmm. they'd spin up like a hairdryer. They'd get so loud when they were under load. I'm not kidding you. Yeah. And then they, and then maybe 2014, 2015, they list, I mean, they were selling a lot of them to the home theater enthusiasts, right? Because it was mm-hmm. so much power for the money. Right. Um, then at 2014, 2015, maybe a little bit before, they did another revision of it and quieted the fans quite a bit down. And I think the NX series that's out now, they don't really spin up like they used to. Yeah. This my I'm I have four INUX 6000s in their 2015 time frame purchase. Mm-hmm. They don't ever spin up. You can't. You could power them off with too much power draw before you, they wouldn't spin up. They just don't. Mm-hmm. So Joey says his NX 6000D was loud. Probably first gen. Well, no, NX is not. That's interesting. I mean, loud is one thing, but spinning up like a hairdryer is another thing entirely. They don't spin up like a hairdryer anymore. That's funny. All the lights dim to <laughs> when it kicks on. Uh, Richard says, do you recommend an expensive video wall system such as a megapixel Ventane 0.8 inch pitch over a projector and good quality screen? So the age old question we're moving to these larger video wall systems. Pretty expensive right now. You know, would you go with that? I know what Jonathan's answer is. If it if it's good enough quality, got to be OLED. Gotta the be megapixel OLED. Ventane is. All these video walls are still insanely expensive. Yeah. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah, it's it. I don't know. It depends on what projector you're comparing it to. I mean, if you're comparing it to a Christie Eclipse. You know, I don't know. Probably more in line in price. Yeah, they're just so far away for affordability for most people. I think it's going to be 10 or 15 years before it's kind of mainstream. I got a novice question here, and I don't know any better, but what's the 0.8 inch pitch mean? Does that mean anything to you guys? I don't know what that means. It's the pixel density. So, so the lower than is the higher the number the better or the lower? I think it's lower. The lower. Lower the number. Well, like how what how many pixels are in 0.8 inch? If it's 0.8 inch per pixel, that's a that's a no no no. That's <laughs> I don't ridiculously huge pixel. <laughs> the one inch pixel. <laughs> it's the pixel gap. Oh yeah, Ryan says pixel gap. Well, that's horrible too. It's you gotta, it's not that bad though. Pixels? No, that's not how it. So is that that's the distance between each panel? No, okay. no, it's not. He says zero it's point not eight inch. millimeters. Inch isn't right. It's millimeters. Yeah. And zero point eight millimeters MW. It's the distance between each pixel. Okay, correct. That's pretty Lower. big, isn't it? One millimeter distance no, on a they pixel. They get a lot. They get a lot bigger than this. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is kind of the how based on your pixel pitch is how far away you need to be away from that to not get that screen door effect. Correct. Uh, um, It's going to drive that. So lower pixel pitch, you can be up closer. Okay. Higher. Looks like a screen door. Yeah. But I'm not sure what's considered like good. Hmm. Yeah. I don't, I don't know what the standard is, but, but definitely we'll be seeing, we'll be having that conversation definitely i would think more in the next five to ten years so not quite mainstream yet finster says i wonder how many people think their system sounds really good until they hear someone's that's better and then realize theirs doesn't sound as good as they thought almost like ruined it for themselves i think that happens that's fair but on the other side i've heard home theaters that are much better than mine but I still come home and I thoroughly enjoy my system, you know? And I guess it, for me, I've just, I've tried to appreciate what I have, you know, even when I didn't have what I have now, you know, 10 years ago when I had a much smaller clip system, I still loved it. But I would go to somebody else's house and go, man, you got way more bass than me or man, your, your clarity and details on another level. But you know, it, it didn't ruin it for me. I still came home and enjoyed my system. But what you will find, 
I think a lot of times is when you go to somebody's house and you experience something that you've never experienced before. Maybe it's deep black levels. Maybe it's tactile base. Maybe it's sub 20 Hertz. I think that's when it can really get the, the wheels turning. You're like, Oh man, I want some of that in my spot. You know, I think Ryan has shared many times he's gone to Jonathan's house and goes, all right, we're doing that in my house. Mm -hmm. Am I correct? All right. Mm -hmm. We're still on a $1.2 million theater. Shut up, Jonathan. <laughs> you know, uh, Rusty, have uh, you ever been to somebody's house and you came back or, or an event, maybe you came to M wave and you heard something, experienced something and you went, yeah, I, I need that in my life. Oh yeah. Well, I, yeah, I talked about it last week. One of the big ones was, you know, the tactile. I felt like that was a whole dimension I didn't know existed. Mm -hmm. And, um, and once he, once I had it, once I experienced it at a, at a few places, then it's like, man, I got to have that. Now it didn't mean I came home and hated my system. It just mm -hmm. gave me, it was aspirational. Like I, now I want to, sure. I aspired to achieve it. And, um, that's when I started I mean, I built those cabinets myself from a kit. Um, so, I, you know, I look at it as aspirational. Yeah. And I think it, it can go both ways if it's healthy. Sure. <laughs> That's messed up. Nicholas says M-Wave has the tendency to give people depression. Um, <laughs> nah. I think I, I'm going to challenge you a little bit, Michael. And you What's can that? kick back at me. Yeah, let's, let's do it, man. Let's have some I, fun. I feel like your theater components, and I'm assuming your install is fantastic as well. I feel like your theater components are top shelf. Yes. So you, there's, we've talked about this on the podcast before too. Once mm -hmm. you get to a certain threshold, Correct. it's shades of good. Right. But and where I think I'm you're going, there. Well, but what I'm saying, think about, it. I've been doing home theater tours for six years. Sure. Six years ago, mine was a Klipsch set up, set up. I had, at one point, I had 25-year-old speakers. No, I'm sorry. They're 40-year-old speakers. They were made in 1980. They were Klipsch La Scala's. Sure. Great speakers, but they weren't the best speakers out there by any means. But I had um, even some smaller clip speakers, the RF-83s, had the RC-64. And I would go to other people's homes that had better sounding systems than mine, but I would still come home at the end of the day and I didn't have like, oh my gosh, my system sucks. You know, it was, I, I could just, I'm at a point in my life where I can appreciate somebody else, what they have, even if I don't have that. Sure. And the, you know, uh, my buddy, he brought over his um, Ferrari one time. He's a doctor. He's like, oh man, you got to ride my new Ferrari. I'm like, I'd be glad to ride in your Ferrari. Thank you very much. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah. And so we take off. I mean, he's hauling, but amazing. He gets a Tesla plaid. I go over to his house. Boom. Insane. Then the last one he brought over, he had wrecked the Ferrari. Uh, I don't think it was his fault, but he wrecked the Ferrari and he ended up getting a McLaren. It was like a $240,000 car. And beautiful. Oh my gosh. So much fun. But not at one point did I go, man, my Ford Explorer sucks. You mm -hmm. know, and my Ford Explorer is fine. But I guess I just, I don't really look at other people's stuff. I'm going to go to Ryan's house. I will, I mean, my system will be like, it won't compare. Yes, it will. But, I, but I'm, all right. So yours will suck then. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, yours doesn't suck. That's what I'm trying to say. I, I feel like you, you know Ryan's saying, but... Ryan's can the diminishing return kicks in yeah. hard, right? Yeah. Ryan's will probably be the best theater any of us have ever heard. Probably right. be. Yeah. It but should be. The diminishing return scale is going to be very small. Yes. I mean, that's what it is, right? So yeah. we've talked about this before on the show. Yeah. I go to Expona and I hear eight hundred thousand dollar speakers. Yeah. And I come home and I'm like, you're like, I'm okay with what I I'm got. I'm okay with where I'm at, right? But there are there are tiers, clearly. Yeah, sure. The, the lowest tiers, your home theater and box off Best Buy Show for $300 yeah. Correct. is different than the next I, tier, is okay. different than the next tier. It, and, and I'm going to suggest, yes. all I'm trying to say is I think you're kind of at the yes. you're at the top tier. Yeah. There's shades of differences in there, but it's yeah. pretty small. But again, I was looking at even earlier days, okay. even 17 years ago, 
I wasn't doing home theater tours then, but I was doing seven, I was doing tours six years ago and that was way before JTR, all clips. I was completely satisfied. I never came home going, that's it. I'm selling all my stuff. This stuff is garbage. So and then you wouldn't have upgraded along the way if you felt that way a hundred percent, right? You'd still be at your original I, I speaker that. setup. I mean, this I is just some banter here, right? I'm not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I think what I'm saying is I wasn't dissatisfied with what mm -hmm. I didn't come home and go, man, my stuff is, I didn't get depressed because I didn't have mm -hmm. what somebody else had. I guess that's what I'm saying. I hear you. Yeah. I, I believe you. I not only, I'm, I believe you. <laughs> I think it's you okay. can definitely both be grateful for what you currently have yes. and also mm -hmm. have a desire to get to whatever Absolutely. that next milestone is. And, mm -hmm. you know, personally, see, I, I kind of like, I like that pursuit mm -hmm. because when there's no upgrade and you get bored, well, you it's change change hobbies. boring because you can't <laughs> change it up. Like Ryan's about to top out and right. he's not like, going to have anywhere to go. Yep. A right. bigger room, I guess. But, you know, you think about it like I not that I wouldn't love to have mm -hmm. that, but part of the fun is the journey and the pursuit mm -hmm. and the incremental like tweaking. I mean, like Jonathan's doing right now in his room and Ryan's doing right now. Well, I guess Ryan's not tweaking. He's, He's tweaking, tweaking, tweaking a lot. just to the max. I just threw away everything that I had. Before. Just discarded <laughs> your entire basement. <laughs> yeah, Let's just start over. So oh, Paul man. says, the moral of the story, no matter how much money, you're never satisfied with the fanciest car after going through three. Just saying audio is the same. Ask Ryan. <laughs> well, are, are you are under the the saying that, though, Paul? I, Paul, I've talked to you before. I, I like you. I don't have any Paul's a great dude, man. But I don't know that I agree with that because I'm kind of saying the opposite. I'm kind of saying once you get to a certain tier, mm. I think you can be satisfied and hear something better. But there's those tiers. I think there are tiers. Sure. But once you're up at a higher tier, there's a lot of there's a lot of range where you can be like, yeah, this is great. I love it. Right. That's all I'm I think, saying. I think you're right. If I now if I would have had say a home theater in a box, mm -hmm. and I went to hear Rusty set up or your setup or Ryan's setup, I would come back and go, okay, my stuff really sucks. Like this is there's no comparison in that. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got little satellite speakers and a little six and a half inch woofer, and I paid two hundred fifty bucks for the whole shebang with the AVR. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's not working too well. So, so yeah, I can I can see that. I would imagine most of us all have a living room set up aside from our home theater. Oh yeah. And when I'm watching something in the living room, I guess my expectations are just different, and I still enjoy it. It's not like sure. I hate it and refuse to turn it on. Correct. Yeah, I prefer the theater, but it, it's you know it's context. It depends on what I'm doing. I can still mm -hmm. enjoy the living room sure. gear and like the theater more you're right they're not okay. mutually exclusive mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. all right a couple more questions here we'll wrap it up uh, chris contreras contreras sorry about that uh is it safe to say the odyssey is easier to set up than the others like wipeow etc and dirac is probably better but more setup is required great question man because we can't that's kind of the not stigma, but that's kind of the, honestly, that's the general consensus. You know, Odyssey is easy, simple, no brainer. You don't have to think much. It does all the thinking for you. If you're not using like the multi EQX, that's a little different story. And then you go to arc a little bit more feature rich, a little bit harder to set up, but it's still relatively easy. But then direct, there's kind of a learning curve to do that. Then if you get to storm, it's a bigger learning curve and, and trend off. Um, but what are your thoughts on that? I agree with the easier to set up, but I'm, I'm curious, is it better? You know what I'm saying? Or I don't, you, honestly, my makes, experience with these auto EQs is years old at this point for the most part. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I have, I did a lot of a comparisons yeah. back 2014 timeframe, but I haven't messed with YPAO, for instance, in years. Mm -hmm. I saw Derek set up. It's not easy. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, Pioneer's got MCACC, and that kind of stinks, in my McGack. opinion. I, I call I it McGack. It's like, that's about what it sounds like. McGack. 
AccuEQ is really easy. It only takes one or three. Maybe it's three up to three positions now instead of eight. It's also pretty straightforward. Yeah. Um, but what here's, what, we here's what we typically hear in Facebook groups and forums. Oh, man, now that you got Dirac, you're I mean, it's going to blow away what you what you've heard from Odyssey or YPOW or AccuEQ. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Any of you? <laughs> I can say so. I I can't speak to YPOW. I've never I don't think I even is that the Yamaha one? Oh, right. oh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I, the last time I touched that was probably 12 years ago and it was just one single point. And I think all it did was set your distances. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't think it actually did an EQ uh, levels and distances. Uh, I can tell you a Dirac. So once you learn some of the nuances of Dirac, it's, it's not that hard. It's, it, it, it is a bit tedious mm -hmm. because you have, well, you don't have to, you can get away with, you know, three, four or five points, but the recommendation is the more points, the better. Well, if you're doing, you know, 16 channels and you're doing 11 points, that's however many test patterns it's running through. So it's just, it, it can be kind of time consuming. And then, you know, somebody always makes a noise at the wrong time and air conditioning comes on or whatever it is and just ruins that measurement. And, but it, there are some nuances to direct and there's a forum thread on ABS forum that helps kind of guide you through how to get the best results out of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, a lot of it's in the very, the first few steps. It's not, like I said, it's not hard. It's just, I think direct there, they make it harder than it needs to be on some of these things. But as far as results, mm -hmm. um, I can say that my system I don't know how to manually EQ and that's something I do want to learn how to do. Um, and so I can set levels and distances very, you know, that's easy. Uh, but when I compare Dirac off to Dirac on, it's a pretty massive difference, like mm -hmm. massive improvement, even right. with the same levels. Um, it's significant. Now I'm, I'm intrigued because I always hear, you know, so maybe I guess I do want more, right? Um, I hear Ryan and Jonathan talk about the, uh, the the wonders of manual EQ, and now I want more. You know, I want to find out, unlock the next level. So that's uh, that's my experience with Dirac. Okay, fair enough. Erod says uh, Dirac achieves better curves, but not entirely audibly better. But it's fun when you get the hang of it. I think. A big part of it is at a base level, a lot of them are going to be very similar. Um, okay. Some of them will handle phasing better than others. Makes um, sense. Some of them will handle low frequency a little bit better than others, but a lot of them still struggle with alt ultra low frequency, like mm -hmm. your infra stuff. Uh, I think the big difference, like we talk about with picking an AVR pre pro, is just the granular options that you can get with some of them. Like Dirac is much more granular than Odyssey. As yeah. an example, I mean, you have a lot more control, especially when you start talking about art in comparison to what you can do with Odyssey. Now, mm -hmm. will it give you a better result? That's on how you, you use, you, right? yeah. But a big part of it is you can dial things in more akin to what you want, mm -hmm. I think, in comparison to Odyssey, where it's just going to be here's what you get. Now, yeah, you can use the multi EQX Pro app and get some better stuff. Um, but you still don't have the control of that and the capabilities of what Dirac's doing. I mean, art's really cool. And Trenov with the optimizer, that's also really cool. I mean, the support groups and the ability to have things support each other when done correctly can fix a lot of room problems. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I think they're, they're a lot more similar than people think they are. Yeah. My suspicion, and this is just a hypothesis, is that if you tested, say, the top three auto EQs in four different rooms with four different speakers, it wouldn't be the same winner in each room. Yeah. yeah. So You're I, totally right there. I think, I think some are going to be better the, for certain situations and some are going to be better for others, just the way their algorithm works. I can see that. Uh, Robert says, my question, are apps like Apple TV, et cetera, Netflix, better on a streaming box? Or is it built into your TV? 
So would a separate device that has streaming capability like an NVIDIA Shield, Apple TV, is that inherently different or better possibly than what's built into your TV? It depends on what is happening with the app inside the device and what that device supports, right? So a lot of times what people do with their devices on TVs is they're backhauling using like Toslink mm -hmm. or eARC. And you have to remember that not only are we now limited by the app itself, you're now limited also by the bandwidth capabilities of things like Toslink and eARC, mm -hmm. backhauling that to your AVR. So if you've got, I don't know, 17 speakers, you ain't getting that through toss link or eARC. It's not mm -hmm. happening, right? Because you're limited. So those are just some considerations and things to remember. Um, it just The biggest thing though, is it goes back to when we were talking about Apple TV. Certain apps on certain platforms are gonna have certain limitations and it's important sure. for you to research those. Yeah. Evangeliste, Jonathan, can you please make us a basic video on how to manually calibrate and how you do home theater sound equalization. So that is a challenge for you on your channel. That's what we he got said. about four or five videos in the hopper. I just haven't finished. Yeah, I've dude. been working on this room too much. Awesome. Yeah. I'll, I'll I was, get I was the one that started that comment because I want to see your video. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, hey, bro, I want to I want to see some more content for Jonathan. Eddie says, thanks, SRW1000. So is there a complete database of movie shows already on the HTTP1? So he's talking about BEQ. Is the information directly presented present on the HTTP1, or do you have to import those? Yeah, um, I can answer that. Um, it's it's a custom user interface that links to the BEQ catalog that's hosted online. So it doesn't actually download to your device, but mm -hmm. you can access it, and it's you know super quick. But it's integrated with the user interface. Right. Tony, this is just for you. We got three more questions. Mm. So they're all start. He was asking, <laughs> how is this gonna go, man? Interesting. <laughs> as, if we, as if we're holding here against as well. Get out of here, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're he, saving the good stuff for last, so don't <laughs> go anywhere. <laughs> Hang exactly. tight, lose, Tony. Rusty. Right. Do what? We're giving. I guess we're losing. Am I losing everybody? What's that? Can you hear me? No, I hear you. I think we're losing those two. Who? Tony? Is the stream dying? No, no. we can hear I you. Can hear can you hear us? You're good. Must I'm going be through a tunnel. I can hear Jonathan fine. I can hear everybody. Fine. I can hear everybody. I can't hear the other two. Yeah. Huh. You got those, you got those swans and that sub kicking in the background. Mm. And then stuff. MW says, is Rusty and Ryan from an alternate dimension? That's weird. It is. It's it's, oh, it's from we're things? from the multiverse. Yes, yeah, all it. good. I can hear everybody. Okay. Yeah, so maybe on your end. Uh let's see. Last couple well, if questions. It's me. I'm gonna let you guys finish on your own then, and I'm just gonna yeah. log off so that you guys can like I said, I'll see you fine. Yeah, I mean, we still hear you fine, Ryan. Yeah, yeah I can hear you. And they're saying in the them. chat. They keep dropping and come back. Sark says I hear everybody. Weird. It's the Matrix, man. Shree says, hey, youth boy, I'm from India. Can I go for my 17 by 15 by 10 room for theater? Which one for movies? All right. Okay, so he's kind of comparing Arndall 1723 monitors for all his bed layer or Bowers and Wilkins CT 7.3s as LCRs and the remaining be Arndalls. Interesting concept. So he's got 17 by 15 by 10. So he either wants to go all Arndalls for bed layer, the monitors, or do Bowers and Wilkins up front, and then maybe Arndalls for the remaining speakers. I just like that he called you youth boy. I, I kind of well, like okay. it too. So so think about this. You got to understand too, and I don't know. I, did, I give people the benefit of the doubt. There could be a language barrier there too. Uh, yeah, I, I know, but I'm, I'm saying I like it. Uh, we like it. Yeah, it's not. Me, uh, well, somebody they were like youth boy. I was like, why would you say that? It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, n n no offense intended. I, uh, yeah, I I think it's good. No, I, don't, I don't think that at all. Yeah, he's like youth boy. What? Until you get 50 inch subs, you're forever <laughs> this youth boy. 
Oh gosh, man, man. we we kind of say this on podcast after podcast. We can't really advise you on which speaker you like better between that stuff because your ears are gonna prefer something different than our ears might. So, like, unless you were giving us a specific target, like, hey, I want reference volume and I want you know this much headroom or whatnot. Like, as far as a subjective preference, that's on you, bud. You gotta you gotta kind of listen to them and see what you like, or maybe the type of sound that they prefer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can tell. I haven't. I, I don't know about that specific Bowers model. Um, mm -hmm. I know that generally when I've heard Bowers in a showroom, they, they sound real bright, like mm -hmm. really kind of high frequency, a lot of it. And I've listened to the 1723s in comparison side by side next to uh, my Rebels and JTRs. And they, now this wasn't a scientific anything. This was just listening. Yeah. And I would say that the, Arundel, or I still don't know how to say it properly, but Arundel, uh, yeah. Arundel, mm -hmm. um, they, they're they're much more neutral, so they sounded pretty similar to the performance, the Rebel Performer threes, and I liked them. I think it's a great value, but it's they're B and W is known for being pretty bright, so mm -hmm. I as far as mixing them, I wouldn't probably go one direction or the other. I'd pick a path. Yeah. And if you can get out, like you said, if you can get out to hear that, maybe in a dealer showroom or something like that, that'd be ideal. The hard part is, Arndall, you're probably not going to get an opportunity to hear them. Um, they got that in-home thing, though, right? 60 days in-home with mm -hmm. Arndall? Sure. I don't know if Bowers has anything like that, but um, Aaron okay. Arndall certainly does. Yeah, Jonathan, aside from the, um, you know, the not meeting reference, did you enjoy those 1723s when you had them? Mm -hmm. I I didn't have a problem with them. They didn't lighten my heartbeat alive, and I don't and I don't really know how to explain that. And I'm not pretending that I speak for everybody because I don't. Mm -hmm. We talked about this on the podcast before. I've been in a blind meet where we had 20 people in there, and half the people liked one speaker and half the other, and they were passionate about it. Like, right. how can you not like this speaker? This one's clearly superior. Both Obviously. sides saying the same thing, right. right? So so I don't pretend to speak for everyone, but they but they didn't excite me for some reason. They sounded very nice and neutral. Like I didn't have a problem. I couldn't detect anything wrong with them as far as like just listening to them. Um, maybe a little bit shy on reference, that type of thing that we just talked about, but not, but mechanically nothing, nothing wrong. Like not no, no fault to point a finger at, but, I, but they didn't excite me like my JBLs do. So I don't know. I don't know how to speak to that. This is, this is bias. It's just, it's just subjective, okay. subjective preference. Right. And yeah. I also think, I don't know how you do this, Michael. I, yeah. I've, you know, I, I kind of think we come hostage almost to the sound that we listen to on a daily basis. And we, it gets a little home field advantage, if you will, because I mean, I this isn't hundred percent true. You can go to another place and hear a speaker you like better, but yeah. I think just like the whole 60 day, you know, keep it for 60 days and try it. And you, you become acclimated to the sound and you, and you start liking it more over time because yeah. it becomes more familiar to you. I think by the time you've had a set of speakers for five years, they got a pretty big home field advantage. And so if that's not, always it, there to it overcome. It would have been sold though. Mm -hmm. Truthfully, Like, you know, if you didn't really, really enjoy them, you would have found another path for your sure. setup. Sure. Mm -hmm. Sure. I, and these were a speaker that I, when I first heard them, I loved them. Mm -hmm. There's something, I, and I, I don't know if it would be like, Hey, I do a frequency response side by side and try to, I, I, Maybe Aaron's audio corner, maybe Aaron could figure out how that works or like which one I would like and be able to detect. I'm not to that level yet. I just know like I can, I have a strong subjective preference and a blind test for one speaker or the other, yeah. but I don't necessarily know how to identify why mm -hmm. I do. Yeah. And, and, and the bottom line is what I like isn't necessarily what Rusty likes or what Michael likes or what Ryan likes. There's just not, yeah. it doesn't work like that. And mm -hmm. I've seen it time and time again in blind test. Yeah. So, so even if I, with that kind of question, and this is where my caution comes in with that kind of question, even if I had heard both and compared them in my room, I would still have that caveat and say like, I like this better, but that doesn't mean you will right. mm -hmm. <laughs> because I've experienced the opposite of that in so many times in these, in these shootouts. Well, and I, I mean, can say too, uh, for, for personally, like I, I do prefer the JTRs, but I really enjoy, uh, Jonathan's, um, JBLs, it's it's so different. It's like two totally different experiences, mm -hmm. and it's not that one's mm -hmm. 
like good or bad. It's that they're both amazing. They're just very, they are very different though. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I've told many people, like if I was to ever do another room or have like add a, another room, I don't know if I could give up the JTRs, but I would definitely um, do those JBL. I forget what they call. I should know this by now. But CBT 70 J. I, think. Mm -hmm. I was close, right? God, yeah, you were at program. 70 J1. Can we okay. get him off the show? <laughs> Who's that? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Last two questions. Joel says, what RT60 decay numbers does everyone have in their home theaters? I've never measured mine, to be honest with you. I have no idea. I have mine when I measured it in the past, but I put it in the comments. I'd have to find that page again. Well, my theater technically doesn't exist right now, so I have no idea. His whole theater room is a decay right now. <laughs> nice. But it's it's getting there. It, it'll be there by M wave. I linked mine in the chat earlier when I linked the Schroeder frequency thing, and I linked okay. it as Michael's name because that's yeah. how it's making me post right now. So if you scroll up in the chat, if you're genuinely curious, scroll up in the chat till you find the ABS form link from Youthman, and that's the link to my measurements to calculate my Schroeder frequency. Okay. It will have the RT60 in it. Okay. Last question of the night. Shree says, hey, Jonathan, ATI 1827 versus Buckeye Purify 7040SA or Hypex in core, which one is for movies? I'm turning this one over to Ryan because he knows the Buckeye product real well. Which one is for movies? I mean, is that even a thing? No. A big part of that's going to depend on what speakers you're driving. Okay. I mean, the 70 SAs, the Purify, there's very little that's going to be better than those Purify modules. Um, they're really good. I had three of them driving my front sound stage on my 15 A's and my 34 C from Martin Logan. Cause they would just eat them. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I were you, I like Buckeye for the price for performance. I think you're going to get a better price point and you're going to get a better performance out of the Hypex or purify modules than you will from the ATIs and the ATIs may be using those same modules, but they're going to be more expensive. So yeah. my opinion on that is going to going to be the same. And I say that with some caveats, how much, how many Watts are the Buckeye Ryan? Do you know off the top of your head? The, the ATI is 200 Watts at eight ohm. The two five two is 252 Watts. I think at four ohms. Um, so a little bit well, more let, power. Let me look. But you're talking, if you're talking 200 to 250 watts, you're talking like a dB difference. So it's not that much more headroom. Well, that's yeah, but you're, you're talking 8 ohms. He's talking 4 ohms. Hold on. So eight on the ATI 1827, it's 200 versus 300 watts, 8 ohms versus 4 ohms. And more importantly than any of that discussion, because we're just talking, no matter how much the wattage is, just a dB type mm -hmm. range, the THD on this ATI Okay. It's listed as 0.005%. Okay. Uh, the signal to noise ratio is listed at 120 dB. So so let's say, I don't even know if that's true or not. You'd have to go to like ASR to see if that's true. Mm -hmm. um, I know that I know the signal to noise ratio on the Buckeye is really solid too. Like you're talking about two amps that distortion levels of 0.005. Right, yeah. You aren't hearing that. Sure. Period, period. You just aren't. And so if the, the differences is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Those two, yeah. Well, if one of them is 0.005 and the other is 0.004, right. you could bet your life on it. You're not going to hear the difference no matter how trained you are. It's not even, it's not even humanly perceivable to hear that kind of synapse. That's like, if you're talking 120 dB type mm -hmm. scores, signal to noise ratio, that's out, that's off the charts. So then you're down to the difference. Assuming they don't have any kind of like tube characteristics or something where they're trying to change the tonality, it's going to be a flat response between what humans hear and the distortion levels are so low, humans won't hear it. Now you're talking about the difference in power. The difference in power mm -hmm. is so slight that you'll probably never notice the difference. So to me, those amps, they're well over, over engineered on both of them and get which one of them is cheaper. That's the way I'd, or, you know, less expensive to you or has a reliability you want, or, you know, you like the sales manager or the owner or whatever else. I, I don't think you're going to detect a difference in the performance. 
Yeah, somebody's pointing out that the questions may be geared more towards which one's better for a movie specifically. Uh, and um, it doesn't matter. Right. Nope. And if you really think about it, almost every movie has music in it. So if you say that, oh, this is only good for this and not this, then that means that it's almost like a contradiction because you've got, mu move, you've got music all through you know, your music. I'll set it backwards. Get your music. Those, are, those are both like, I mean, Buckeye stuff's really top of the line and the ATI specs are off the chart good too. So those are both super high quality amps. And, and, I'll, and I'll take it one step further. We've had some discussion on this in the, on the forums. There's, you can buy an over-engineered product like that and realize you're getting a good product that's well-designed and well-made and well-crafted and probably very reliable. Mm -hmm. You don't, the threshold of human hearing we we're talking about is much, 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 much lower than 0 0.005. Sure. Um, I was reading some things on, on, on ASR today, trying to look at some different discussions on this. The signal to noise ratio that people seem to be able to, you know, the SYNAD scores, let's go back to SYNAD scores because ASR uses that a lot. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of discussion saying that in testing, people can't really tell much over 60 or 70 on the whole. And you're talking 120, 100 plus at least on both those amps. I don't know the buck off the top of my head, but you're you're way up there at the top. So you're talking like a tremendous difference on what humans can hear over to your over-engineered thing. So so what I'm trying to say is you maybe don't have to spend as much money as that unless you just want an over-engineered product that's like a nice product. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But but you could probably get something with an 80 Synad score and never be able to tell the difference. Like uh, you know a a, a crown pro audio amp or something as long as the fans don't bother you or it's a silent like the xls series mm -hmm. so i'm not telling you what to buy i'm just saying that those are very good amps and you might not even need that good of an amp to save yourself money if you're inclined yeah cool man probably one comment here that ties in with what you're saying jonathan or at least something to think about possibly is if because I about half of my audience is international. They're outside the U.S. That is um, a really good point. Hmm. So it might be more difficult for, um, you know, a company that is mainly focused in the U.S. right now to be able to provide really good support, you know, in another country. So, but then again, I don't know where ATI is if they're international or or what. So, but definitely some things to think about. Well, cool, guys. Well, we have had a good time. Um, just want to throw this out. We mentioned this at the beginning of the show. There's currently an M-Wave contest going on. You can head over to MidwestAVExperience.com slash contest. And basically, we've had some generous donors that have donated one general admission ticket and three VIP home theater experiences. And so one of you is going to win that in a month. So all the details are on the website. Um, submit your videos, man. I'm excited. All the information is on there. I, and I did a video on it too today. So if, if you want to watch that video and, and check it out. So love to have you guys join us for M-Wave June 21st through the 23rd. Of course, all the details are on the website. So hope you guys have an incredible week, man. Yeah. And fun. if you haven't bought your M-Wave tickets, go do it right now. Don't wait until the week before. We want to know. We need numbers. It you helps. know what to plan it for. Planning. Yeah. Yeah. We got volunteers. We got to figure out. No, yeah. no procrastinating. Buy your tickets right now. That makes sense. See, Rusty, you're on it, man. <laughs> I'm I'm rooting for you. No, it, it makes more sense because it, it is. It's easier to prepare for an event. Last year we had 50 people show up like at the door and register the like the day before. You even had people show up on Sunday and try to get in in the yeah. afternoon, right? And how do I pay and stuff? Yeah, we did. And we'll we'll do it again <laughs> this year. But it's like, it, it helps us definitely in the planning and preparation. So cool deal, man. Well, guys, I hope you all have an incredible week. Um, got some new content coming for you this week. I'll be doing some videos on, I don't know if it'll come out this week, but I got a new sofa baton. Not sure I'm excited about it, but they wanted to send it to me. I told them up front, I said, look, if it's quirky and if it's um, glitchy, I'm not bothering doing a, a review on it. And they said, fair enough. So, which what model is it? Are you allowed to say? Yeah, yeah. This is a new one. It's called the X1S. 
That's not the one Ryan was talking about a few podcasts ago, is it? So is it That's Ava. Okay. That's yeah. something totally different. Yeah. I just don't know if this is the right model for me. Um, I mean, I want a touch screen, doesn't have a touch screen. It's got this little wheel remote or like a wheel to go through the menus. It's just different. So but it looks identical to what I reviewed a while back, but it it was pretty buggy. So I wasn't real big of a fan on that, but but we'll see. So I've got that. I've got the new Valencia seats, the Monza. And so those will be in for review just for a brief period. I'm going to ship those off to Ryan. Um, and then he's going to store them for M-Wave. And so you'll get a chance to, to see what the Monzas are. They've got carbon fiber on the sides. So they're definitely a different, like a very modern design. I'll have a video on that. So, so you know, I love how the comments are already giving away Ryan's new speakers. Oh, like his oh, black funny, swans yeah. are giving away and his 50 inch subs giving, giving away. Yeah, yeah, man, you, you can carry know. it down the driveway without <laughs> any assistance and that's no awesome. tools. That's right. You can have it. That's that's part of the official contest entry. It's, it's going to be like bug splatters all over the driveway from it falling on people as they've tried. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sorry. Great thing answer your question i don't know what svs is bringing we're still waiting on they have confirmed they're coming back with um nebraska furniture mart we just don't know what they're bringing um i told nick i said i would definitely love to see them bring their new speakers let's hear them let's check them out give everybody an opportunity to see what they're about um so i think they're probably going to bring that i just don't know how big that system will be and yeah and then joel Look forward to seeing your video, buddy. That's awesome. All right, guys. Y'all have a great week. Take care. Night. See you guys later.